Yeah. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. <laughs> so what happened last night? You went to Lemmy's. Yeah, Lemmy's 70th birthday at the Whiskey. And was it fucking nuts? Oh, man. Invitation I mean, only? Or yep. people paid to go? No, ahead? invitation only. Okay. Now, they had done it 20 years ago on his 50th, and Metallica played that one, where each guy in Metallica dressed as Lemmy, and they were called the Lemmys. And that was pretty fucking epic, man. You can Google it and look at it or YouTube it. But um, this time, they put together an all-star, tons of guys. It was like uh, Steve Jones, Sex Pistols, Billy Idol, uh, Sebastian Bach, Slash, uh, Ian, um, uh, Scott Ian from Anthrax. You had Dave Lombardo, Slayer, another Cuban. Um, I mean, it was on and on, all these guys. And they played all kinds of songs. They opened with some Zeppelin. They did some uh, Just Got Paid by ZZ Top. Um, they did some, then they learned some 50s songs that uh, Lemmy loved, and they just rotated jammers. Duff McKagan, uh, Billy Duffy from The Cult. It, was, it wasn't like no C League. This was like the hitters were out there, man. But Rudy Sarzo wasn't there. Yeah, well, was I was there. invited, but uh, I got the call. I was on my way to a to family uh, holiday reunion, you know, and it's like the type that you pick people up and then you got to bring them back. And by the time. You know, I was home. It was like, you know, the trip to fan hit, and you know, I was passed out. <laughs> well, uh, before we go any further, you were saying something very interesting. Happy birthday to you, brother. Hey, yeah, thank you. Thank you. 65. 65 years That's old. Right. And you're just getting oh, started. No, you're young. just getting fucking 65 started. 65 year, year young. You're yeah, just getting yeah, started. Yeah. When we were growing up, if you heard the number 65, you were like, Jesus know, Christ, what, I'm what fucking dead. Yeah. You're going on tour next year. You, you know, it's just amazing what the things you could do if you take care of yourself. I'm doing senior homes next year. <laughs> Fuck it, whatever. Yeah, he looks he, better than me. Yes, yeah, he does. Yeah. Whatever pays the mortgage, yeah. Rudy. <laughs> <coughs> That's a music. It's it's just a, a beautiful thing that you're still out there. Did you think that you'd still be out there at 37? When you, you know were what? Doing the I, of Oz, confused. Young. You know, I I love watching Crossroads, which is uh, the events that Eric Clapton puts on just about every year. Right. You know, and I would say everybody. Every time I watch the show, most of the people are way older than I am, and they're still like killing it. You know, they're playing the blues and they're rocking out. You know, and it's like, oh my god, you look like a buddy guy. He owns the stage every time he gets up there. You know, he's a killer. Eric Clapton. I mean, everybody across the board. And I go like, yeah, I want to do that, man. I want to be, you know, when I'm that old, you know, I want to be like Miles Davis, die on the road, you know, playing, you know, being a musician. This is what I am. I'm How old is Clapton now? I don't know. Yeah, Lee, can you look that up? Yeah, absolutely. Because Lemmy is 70 last night, you know? Yeah. Or, uh, oh, look it, at Lemmy. Yeah. Was he there last night drinking yeah, and shit? He, he was there. Hell yeah. Was he drinking? Yeah, he drinks. Was he smoking cigarettes? I'm sure. He's, he's never changed. He's not like, uh, uh, I'm getting at this age, I better uh, slow down. You know, he's yeah. exact Lemmy from like 69 Lemmy. Or that guy was a roadie for Hendrix. You first, know? first tour I did with Ozzy, Motorhead, was the opening oh, band. The opening band, right. Yeah, right. and I got to tell you, I... Lemmy wore on stage and off stage the same clothes. You know, it wasn't like, uh, well, we have our, you know, on stage outfits and then we're going to have like, you know, this is what I wear, you know, in the bus or whatever. No, it was like th these guys and the, the whole crew and band was the same thing. You know, just like blue jeans, jackets and jeans and that's it. You know, just, you know, I, except that I think he put on the bullet. The bullet yeah, belt. belt. Yeah, I put the belt when he went on on stage, and then he took it off when he got off the stage. That's about it. You know, How they had it? a they had a ten minute video of like a fifteen minute video of his life, which is far too short. But as it went through, it started from uh, like early on when he was like fourteen to now, and it was unbelievable. Yeah, like, who he had played with, who he hung with. He was Keith Emerson's roadie. Back in the '60s, when they, the, he had the band The Nice, yeah. and he's the one who gave Keith Emerson the daggers wow. to stab the keyboard with. So, you, you, did you yeah, hear about yeah, that? Yeah, 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 you know, Emerson used to be like insane. Right, right. Emerson Lake and Palm. Yeah, yeah. Before well, this is before that. Before that, yeah. absolutely. The Nice, yeah, yeah. you know, they had that song America, da 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 da, yeah, da yeah. you know, on the on the uh, on the organ. And part of the shtick was that he would take these daggers and just like make chords. You know, like like keep chords, you know, on, and just and then he will solo on top of that and throw the 
organ on, you know, around the stage and stuff. But it was Lemmy who gave him the, uh, they were actually yeah. German Nazi daggers. <laughs> he worked for Hendrix too, right? Yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah. he was yeah. Hendrix's yeah. roadie. Yeah. You know? And insane. And then he starts, uh, he plays in Hawkwind, which is the, like the first early, uh, they see what the Grateful Dead's doing. And they go, we want to do that, but in a 60s kind of uh, London acid way. And Hawkwind's like the psychedelic, crazy, yeah. huge band, you know, yeah. like a uh, huge underground band. Do a lot of musicians get their start being roadies? Because it seems like it'd be a great learning experience. Yeah, like an open mic or, you know. I mean, I, you learn from hanging out at bands, rehearsals and stuff, right, when you're a kid. You know, you're at a band. I was like a, a young kid at an older band's uh, Vicious yeah. Rumors. You know, that band there, they're like a metal yeah. band, and I would hang at their rehearsals and learn shit, you know? Well, I know, like, if you're a guitar tech, yeah. right? You've Obviously, you're a guitar tech. You're a badass guitar player, right or wrong? Oh, no. Not really? Not Some guys learn the... Uh, because you have to, like, uh, tune in the chords for the guy, whatever the hell it is. So you have to be learning something along the way. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's people in this town that come in as comedians, and they, that's what they do. And there's other guys that end up writing and doing a little bit of television, and you just learn along the way. You become a sort of like a master of everything. You know, Prince could play everything. You could play a bunch of fucking instruments, can't you? I play the radio. Right, okay, you <laughs> play the fucking radio. Yeah. But it's uh, Lemmy was just one of those guys that learned it A to fucking Z. You can't go to Lemmy right You go to Lemmy right now and go, Lemmy, I'm going on tour. Can you come and look at the stage set up? And he'll go there and just point little things, make the curtains blue. Make this red. Just things that you learn from fucking doing it that somebody yeah. can't tell you. Yeah, but the you, problem is you you want to understand what he's saying. What he's saying, right, <laughs> right. right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love how he talks. You know, uh, he's the speech was a good one. That's about it. Uh. <laughs> All right, so here you are. Uh, uh, whatever the fuck. Uh, the first band, and then you move on to Ozzy. And Quiet Ryan, Riot. And Quiet Riot, and uh -huh. then you go on this tour that lasts God knows how long. You didn't, you guys didn't even expect that type of success. They all did. They, they used to last for a year and a half. For a year and a half. Yeah, oh yeah. And he is, it is with Lemmy and Motorhead every Well, yeah, yeah, the, the Ozzy. Well, actually, the first, yeah, it was the first leg of the Blizzard of Oz tour. And the end of the tour, uh... We went over to England to a place called uh, uh, an event, a festival called Port Vale, and this is 1981. Uh, and Motorhead headlining, Black Sabbath with Ronnie was supposed to be the band that we're going to play before Motorhead, you know, like special guests. And they pulled out for some reason, so Motorhead asked Ozzy, hey, you guys want to be the one? So we actually, we, we took the Concord because we, we had like one day to do it, Whoa. to go back and play and come back, right? And we did the gig, and then we got back in the Concord and got to New York before we left London. You know, we left like 8 o'clock in the morning. We got to New York at like at 7 or 6. Wow. You know, it's something ridiculous. Like the, Concord. the Concord. The Concord, yeah. <sighs> yeah. That's rock star shit right no, there. No, no, rock star shit is watching Ozzy peeing outside the bathroom because he couldn't get in the bathroom in the Concord. No. Yeah. No yeah. fucking way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, he pissed on the wall at the Concord? Yeah. <laughs> well, on, on the door, on the door of the yeah. bathroom. Yeah, there were like three or four bathrooms on one side, and he couldn't get in, so he just, there was Ozzy pissing. Oh, there. my yeah. God. Did anyone see him? I did. <laughs> <laughs> did I say anything? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Motorhead as our opening band. That's. It was sick. Because I remember going to see the, at the Palladium show, it was Motorhead. Mm -hmm. And going, who the fuck are these savages? Yeah. yeah. These guys yeah. are savages. Yeah, listen, this... you know, we, let put it this way. Our bus was very clean because, you know, Sharon was trying to keep Ozzy out of, out of trouble, you know, as best she could. So we had nothing in our bus. Then you go to Motorhead's bus, there's like hookers and strippers and blow and vodka <laughs> and pizza and whatever, you know, piles of people and all over the bus. <laughs> oh, yeah. Man. <laughs> It's you funny, know. that's what I think green rooms are going to be, and then anytime I go in a comedy green room, it's probably more laid back than, than your bus with Sharon. It's, it's like just people like just sitting like it's a waiting room. That's it's, different yeah. scene, though. Yeah. Different scene, yeah. you know? I think now you're, 
you got to look pretty professional because you don't want the club owners to come back and go, these guys are just doing blow and they're all fucked up. I don't want them back. You know? I was telling somebody the other day that I don't know anybody who's a comic right now that's causing any problems. Yeah. Nobody. Yeah. There's no, beside Cat Williams, you know, a couple of years ago, God rest his soul, there was a story about Mitch Hedberg every other weekend, you know. There's always, when I started comedy, there was a couple guys that were still getting fucking hammered. Yeah. You know, George Lopez still had both kidneys. That motherfucker was getting fucked up in 99 and 2000. Yeah. Then What's Her Name saw him and got him on the show. And But there was a time, I remember being in Miami with George Lopez and going, where the fuck is George? On the floor. He was on the floor. I'm not making a joke. On the floor. Wow. I had to do radio for him as a feature act. He wouldn't get up the next day. George was the real deal. Yeah. Mitch, every two weeks, you know, before that, you had Kennison and Kennison. that crew I, that was causing yep, havoc. Yep. And last night, you took pictures with Duff. Yeah. Red Band. And I read Duff's book. Yeah. You know, and I suppose Duff is clean now. Yep, absolutely. And you're clean. Yep. And you're clean. Oh, yeah. And, uh, Everybody in this room is clean from, I mean, I smoke pot. I yeah. love smoking pot since I was a kid. I do it just as, it's not like, a, look, I went and smoked the whole joint of shit that kills most Americans. I do it now just out of fucking habit, just yeah. out of stupidity. Any day now I'm going to wake up and think, I'm not smoking this no more because it don't do nothing. It don't do nothing no more. But it's amazing how your life changes. Mm. How at one time, you know, it was everywhere. It was fucking everywhere, Rudy. Anywhere you turned. You were on the road with Ozzy and Savages. He played with Sam. Yeah, yeah you he played, played with, with Sam. Sam. Yeah, and that yeah, whole yeah. fucking scene there. He and, made Ozzy look like a beginner. And I remember that I, I, I used to, when I, you know, <laughs> till, till eight years ago, I would go on the road and I'd get high afterward. And yeah, from time to time, you pick up a victim at the club and they suck your dick and you, know, you got to throw them out the next board or whatever. <laughs> but I couldn't even... <laughs> Like right now, even if I wanted to, like, sobriety for me from drugs has been easy because even if I wanted to, yeah, I wouldn't do it. It's like I don't see the, and you look at all, you know, I still remember Slash and Guns N' Roses on the American Music Award, whatever the fuck yeah. they were on that yeah. time. And on television, national television, they were fucking gone. Yeah. They were just ripped at Grammys, whatever the fuck it was, that show that one year. Yeah. And yeah, now, American Music Awards. And now people just move on, you know? I just saw the final hours of Michael Jackson. Anybody catch that? Yeah. That documentary? Yeah, it was great. He was fucking getting down. Yeah. I mean, Michael Jackson said, fuck it, I'm wearing a wig, Jack. I need to get... I mean, he was fucking putting shit in his body we wouldn't dream about. <laughs> But besides that, as musicians, I don't know anybody who's really drugging it up anymore. Comics, what do we, uh, my green room has nothing, has <laughs> waters. Yeah. yeah waters. Right. I don't have blow. I, I brought bananas today. Bananas to a <laughs> fucking thing. It's amazing how you evolved. You never thought of that. When you were on the Blizzard of Oz and a couple bands after that and Sam, you would be there like going, when does this shit end? I was talking about that the other day. Would Sam still be getting high if he you was know, alive? You know, you just brought up something really interesting. Yes, absolutely. And, and I got to tell you a bit of it. It's, uh, uh, and this is, I'm not saying this is the way it is, but this is an observation. Uh, I think that what happens is, you know, you, you start getting successful and you become untouchable. You become unbreakable, bulletproof, and then shit happens. And it brings you right back down to earth. You know, like with, in my case, it was Randy. Randy on the plane crash. That has like brought me back to reality, you know. Uh, but I think today, and I, I'd love to hear your opinion on this, because of social media, I am in direct contact with the fans. The, we have lost that putting musicians in a pedestal. Mystique. You know, mystique. It's all like we're, you know, we're all at the same level here. So that be becoming unbreakable, untouchable doesn't really exist anymore because you become really transparent to these people. They really know. I mean, they know what my wife looks like, my little dog. You know, they see pictures of my house, pictures of me hanging out, you know, stuff like that. The walls so are down. The walls are down. So that gives you a little bit more of, of a center. You're more planted rather than to be like feeling like you're untouchable, like above anybody. And I think that's what happened. When people start thinking you're above anybody, that's when you say, I'm, well, I can take more drugs than anybody else because I'm above 
everybody else. Look at me. I'm successful doing all the stuff. So I mean, I'm sure Ozzy is yeah, yeah. great as a person, but most people don't pee on plain doors when they have to wait for a bathroom. He's from England. Have you ever been to a pub in England on I've Saturday never been night? In, no. There, <laughs> there's more piss on the on the ground than there is uh, <laughs> there is beer on the bar. I'm telling you, it has to go somewhere, and everybody misses it. Uh, usually they're troughs. You walk into the men's bathroom, it's a trough. It's not like these little toilets like we have yeah, here. Yeah, at the yeah. festivals, they actually have piss walls. I've never seen yeah, anything yeah. like it in Europe. Yeah. So you're at a big festival, yeah. say, the size of Coachella, and you'll just walk up and go, what is that? And it's like a 100-foot wall, and dudes are just pissing right yeah. there in front of everyone on a wall. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, and that's the way he was brought up. So if he sees a wall. Well, he pissed on the Alamo. Come on. Yeah. You got yeah. arrested for that. Yeah. He and it's it from Birmingham, which yeah, is yeah. an absolute ghetto, you know, just like, you yeah. know, the bottom of, of, of Europe. It's actually pretty nice now. Now it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, I went to Sheffield, well, and you're I like, mean, oh, it's nice. Did you ever watch his documentary? You yeah, know, Ozzy. You know, when he was born, it had been like maybe 10 years since the war ended. This place was dilapidated. It had been bombed by the Nazis, you know, so you're being brought up in, next to rubble. Rubble, you know, buildings all destroyed and everything. You Absolutely. Know? You know, so, you know, so you grew up in an environment like that and you have certain, you know, ethics. Also, the, I think the pressure of being the rock star gets you to get crazy too. Well, that's that pressure that I was telling you, you know, we're telling you about. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's not even pressure. It's like this false, false sense of, of being you're successful and people like uh yelling at you and chasing you and, and you can create this full sense of like uh wow I'm 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 like really cool or yeah. untouchable or unbreakable, nothing, you know. And then you start doing st stupid things, you know. But now I think everybody's a little bit more more grounded. Grounded, grounded. 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 and that's yeah. it. Yeah. It's it's just yeah. You know, in the seventies, Jesus, you heard about a band every fucking week and there was no internet. No, I know. You know right? was, there was no internet and you heard, you know, different rumblings and then, you know, I went to in Union City, Pastor Music. Mm -hmm. And everybody who plays the garden goes mm -hmm. to Pastor Music. That's just the way it is. You'd see him, you know, the time I saw Dwayne Aldman and fucking Cher there, oh. I was like, What the fuck is this? And I went in there and I started mm -hmm. taking bass lessons. Mm -hmm. And the guy was telling me, every time these people come into New York, they come over here. They do the garden. They come over to pastoral music. It's been there for 50 fucking years. Yeah, you yeah. Know? And you just heard rumblings of this and that. You don't even hear that anymore. You know, Drake, these black rappers, they don't do nothing. They drink champagne out of a fucking thing with a straw. Yeah. They got a bottle of that shit. Then they drink that cough medicine. That's big now. Yeah. Chris, yep. Chris whatever. Codeine. They don't, they don't, I, when I went to the doctor, they don't have it anymore at the doctors because the, of that. The codeine stuff. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, I've never I've never had it like what they do with poured into soda, but it crazy dreams on that. I drank it. You have psychedelic radical dreams on. It. I couldn't believe it. You're like, whoa! You wake up like I mean, whatever's in there it makes you see monsters. You know yeah, when I you're was, sleeping. I was never a coding guy. Oh, I had man. friends that were into that <laughs> shit, but it's just it's not. I couldn't imagine doing what I did 15 years ago and going on the road. Now I couldn't fucking imagine. Well, here's a good example. This is how clean the slate is. This is how clean the slate is. We lost Scott Weiland last week. But over the last <clears throat> two or three or five years or whatever, you would hear rumblings like that he was still, you know, like he got a DUI on his birthday, hit some cars and stuff. He was like the last, really, of the radical rock star, you know, the one that was still carrying the flag, so to speak, <laughs> of like hearing stuff, right? I mean, I, I would know. I would know. You know, that's... You know, growing up, I, I, I worked with a, lo a lot of musicians who had mental issues. And I got to tell you, rock stars, you know, anybody who's labeled a rock star can get away with anything. Can get away with anything. Things that actors, athletes, politicians, nobody else can get away with. Just, and just because you're a rock star, oh, you know, you're a rock star. Of course you can do that, you know. What baffles me about the rock star is that they'll never give up. Like, that's the rock star I love. Like, you're a rock star, Rudy Sars. I hate to tell you, you're a rock star. You have everything, your aura, uh, your persona, you know, whatever that word is, a rock star. You did it, you did it. But there's people who are fake rock stars. But the rock stars today, 
from that era have not changed. The other day I was scrolling through and I watched the heavy metal thing and I saw poor Michael Shank. I think I yeah, called yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Poor guy didn't even know what planet he was on. Yeah. But he's still a rock star. He oh, don't yeah. give a fuck. He's no. still got the blonde hair yeah. with the fucking chain and leather jacket. He's a fucking rock star. Yeah. And he'll be, you know, some people one day go, you know what? That's I don't do this no more as much. I do this part time. I'm changing my wardrobe. Yeah. You know, these guys have held on and you got to love it. Kurt Hammett, you know. Love him. These guys are just, uh, and I respect that. You know, just because you're not in the war, you're still in uniform, bitch. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You can't be in uniform. It goes both ways. I got a question for you guys because uh, for me, as soon as I get off the stage, I'm already thinking the next time I'm going on stage because to me, that's, right. that's home. Yeah. It's weird. I feel more comfortable on stage than I do crossing the street. As yeah. long as I know what, you know, what songs I'm playing, you know, yep. if I, if, okay, I got it. Okay. So I just get up there and do it, you know, and, and I get lost, you know, I'm a, I'm a different musician with every band that I play, you know, with Ozzy, it was different than Choir Riot and White Snake and, and so on, you know, because I just get caught in, in the, in the, in the spice that everybody else brings in, you know, the flavors, you know, or everything, because every band is different. You know, you, let's say if I, I will be doing Black Sabbath songs with Ozzy. I did a whole record, you know, uh, Speak of the Devil. Then I did Black Sabbath songs with Ronnie. It's a whole different Black Sabbath experience. Doing really? With, oh, God, yeah. Yeah, completely different. It's a, it's a different element that each individual brings in the band. You know, so you, you have to feel that. You have to be aware of what everybody's communicating and, and putting out energy-wise, you know. And I don't have that in... in, in in my life, you know, I have a very normal existence. You know, I got my, my wife uh, for over 31 years. I'm my little dog, and I have a home. I got a brother, you know, um, my folks, and, and all of that. But it's when I get on stage, that's the person that you probably connect with, the guy that you remember me. Oh, I remember watching you in a show or a video or whatever, you know. That's, that's even more real me because it, there's no, there's no, gov you know, nothing, no, no parameters really. It's pre you know, within, complete freedom. Yeah, complete free freedom of expression and, and being myself within the parameters of what I'm doing. Again, you know, I was I'm different player in in every band because there's certain parameters right, in, in every, every band, band right. in every band. You know, like uh, I remember when I joined White Snake, I you know, m being aware of that, I told David, you know, hey, so. What do you want me to do? And he said, be yourself. Okay. <laughs> and I think of all the bands I've ever been in, that was the one that I just went fucking out of my mind on stage <laughs> with. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the he videos, said, just yeah. be yourself. Okay, that's it. Yeah. How, yeah. like, yeah. when you play now, do you get, like, brought back to when you were, like, 25 or however old you were when you started playing? Like, do you feel like you are playing now or is it, like, you're just, like, zoomed back? You know, that is a really good question, and it's multi-layered, my answer to that. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I find that, that if I do songs from that includes past band members that are not longer with us, there's an element of pain when I play those songs, like when we do the, uh, the Randy Rhodes. Yeah, when we did that, you told me that. You said that it was... Uh it's it's hard. It, it's hard because you're on stage and you're like in you, in my mind. I'm there, man. I'm there, like you know. I'm there at whatever gig. Pick it, you know. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm at the garden, you know. Uh, well, Randy wasn't there at the garden, but you know what we're doing, like any in, in, any gig, any gig. I, I the San Francisco Day on the Green, yeah. whatever. You know, it's I I'm there. I'm there with Randy playing those songs. I never forgot you know. that gig. You know, uh, you know, if I if I do a, a choir riot, you know, recently I've been sit, you know, uh, sitting in, you know, just doing one song with choir riot with Frankie, you know, because we, you know, Gunzo and choir riot, we've been doing some shows together this year, and and one 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 show we I, I got into do come and feel the noise, and it was like you know I'm playing with Frankie, you know, come and feel the noise, so of course it's all gonna come back, you know, and there's a, there's an element of pain that I think every band. That is a legacy band today that's been around for over 30 years. They, they bring that element on stage, which is different from watching a tribute band. You know, like if you watch an ACDC tribute band, it's not the same experience as no, watching ACDC no, no. because, first of all, Ron Scott. 
Right, yeah. You know, I mean, Brian Johnson, great, incredible singer, but I'm sure when they do Highway to Hell or TNT, any of those songs, there's got to be Bon Scott on stage with the guys that were there with him years ago. He comes up. He's got to be in their brain saying, shit, Bon Scott's not here. Somebody else is singing the songs. You know, so you have that element of joy, of celebration of the music. You also have the pain that your buddy that you had this amazing journey with is not there anymore. Yeah, that's got to be know. interesting, right? It's fucking like, beautiful. You like, yeah, you're like you we're know? playing that Randy Rhodes thing, and you just, you're playing this tribute to a guy. Like, to me, I'm jamming with you at the thing, and I loved uh, Randy, but you played with him, and he was a brother. So yeah, it's he's like. He's responsible it, for my career. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's got to be really weird. I'm up there like, giving a tribute, and to yeah. you, it's a lost brother. Yeah, I mean, the same thing with uh, uh, when Ronnie passed away, you know, uh, Wendy. Wendy actually masterminded this, uh, it's called Deal Disciples, and I did it for about six weeks, and it was exactly Ronnie's band. You know, you got Scott Warren on keyboards, and Goldie on guitar, and Simon on drums, and, and me, the band, Ronnie's band, but we had two singers, Tim Ripper Owens, and, um, and another singer from, from, from England, and uh, the, and as good as the band sounded, it was painful, man. Because you just, no matter how great the band sounded, you just, even the better the band sounded, the more I miss Ronnie not being there. You know, because it's, yeah, yeah it's painful. That's one of the, this know. is one of the best conversations no. I've had on no. a podcast in my life. No, man. You just opened up my mind. Because you know what made me call you? The other day, about two weeks ago, Three weeks ago, I'm driving, and I hear uh, Diary of a Man. Mm-hmm. Whatever the fuck. I heard it on the way over, isn't it? It was creepy? on today. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was on today. It was crazy? on today, too. Yeah. As I was pulling in. Boneyard, exactly. On, I go, this is unfucking believable I couldn't believe it either. And I was in my house, and I was thinking about <clears throat> how different it would have Like, listen, in my world, one day I went, I had Sabotage, War Pigs, and the first Black Sabotage. That's all I had. Yeah. And my friends called me, and they go, we got an extra ticket to see Sabbat, and... Uh, some band, I don't fucking know, at the garden. You come, and it was a cold night. I was a freshman in high school, and I went over there. And I was blown away, but my friends were like, they sucked. And all of a sudden, Ozzy and Black Sabbath break up. And it was February 19th. It was Bon Scott's, the day Bon Scott died, 1980. Yeah. <clears throat> and I'll never forget that I picked up Cream Magazine. In those days, that was your, that's it. That's your Bible. That Cir- was it. Circus that and was cream. it. Circus yeah. and Cream. Yep. Yeah. And Cream had yeah. just stated that Black Sabbath had just replaced mm-hmm. Ozzy Osbourne with Walker first. Before it was Ronnie James, James Dio. And if you go online, they replaced Black Ozzy Osbourne with the singer from Savoy Brown. Really? As a matter of fact, go on YouTube and look for, uh, the Black Sabbath even did tracks with him. It's fucking painful to listen to. Really? I never even heard that yes. story. Yes. Wow. So, and you knew I only quit Sabbath and went to Jethro Tull for two weeks. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. came back. He was yeah. like, fuck a guy with a flute. Yeah. Fuck <laughs> you. <laughs> I'm from fucking flute Birmingham. Rock. I'm missing a finger. And you want to insult me with the flute. You flute fuck. rock. No. Flute rock. Which, you know what? Say what you want to say. That yeah. motherfucker had some good songs. You hear locomotive <laughs> breath, you want to run over a homeless hey, dude. Aquaman. Yeah, you do. You hear sometimes you hear a lo- lot. When you hear da 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 in the shuffle. And Martin, and listen, bro, Martin Barre is no fucking joke. Yeah. That dude is no fucking joke. Yeah. He's got like two or three jams that Martin Barre goes off. So you got to look for it. It's like Black Sabbath. The name of the band was Savoy Brown. So his name was like Matt something. Heaven and Hell. Put Heaven and Heaven and Hell early recordings. You guys are going to die. That's crazy. So this was the question by why he's looking for this. I'm sitting there going, what if all this shit went down when, look at that, Black Sabbath, Heaven and Hell, live 1980. No, no. This is Black Sabbath put put with Savoy Brown. Black Sabbath was... I saw it on there, and I couldn't believe it. They have early recordings of... They did a fucking... Savoy Brown was, I guess, a band. Yeah, yeah, Savoy yeah. Brown, yeah. yeah. There it is. Dave Walker interview, Black Sabbath. See all the way number four. Wow. 
He played with Savage. Wow. <laughs> Is that Dave Photoshop? Walker doing these wow. days? You know, we've seen the Dave Walker band. How's that going? It's really All right, well. so find Black Sabbath with Dave Walker. Yeah, yeah. See, just, uh, nobody even knew about that. I shit. never knew that. And I so, watched I watched that Sabbath two-part documentary, you know? They had him for two songs. Wow. But it was so fucking painful to listen to. <laughs> they said, forget about it. <laughs> Dave Brown. Dave Walker, I'm sorry. Have, yeah. have you ever seen a photo of a Judas Priest with the original singer? Yeah. That's crazy. It's which, not Rob Alford. Which one do you think it is? All right, put on Dave there Walker. It is, right there. there it is. What I tell you? Uh, Black Sabbath, Junior's Eyes. What is it? 77. Told you they were going to do it with him. This is the end of that. Let's hear this. Oh, shit! <laughs> Sounds like some 80s rock, right? You got the looks at kill! Well, that's where they got it from, because this yeah. is 77. I know, right? Oh, the wall. oh, shit. Oh, shit. Is that Tony that Iommi playing wall? Yeah. Crazy. I don't mind it. I told you. It's, it's dead wild, though. I like it. A lot of people don't know this shit. It's heavy 70s, so, right? You know, okay, it's so, kind of cactus. So we got cactus, nothing. Yeah. We got nothing. And yeah. all of a sudden, I see this EP at fucking uh, in the village, at the, the big whatever it was. And it was the Blizzard of Oz. But he had tried to form, he had tried to form the Blizzard years earlier. Like in 75. Well, somebody had, gave him a shirt. Right. Yeah, somebody gave him a yeah, shirt or something. The Blizzard of Oz. The yeah, Blizzard yeah, of yeah, Oz. Yeah. Something happened early yeah, on. Yeah. Wow. That he had thought about that. My question yeah. was, like I seen you guys at the Palladium, and there was two shows that night. Yeah. Think of this: if if this would have all went down with the internet, and people would have known, people didn't know. Like I said, there was cream and fucking circus, that's and it. that's it. You know, and in those days, you had to mail in for tickets. Yeah. I think I paid for your tickets at the Palladium, but the shows at the Garden before that, like Yes, and all the Who. All those shows that came to the garden, you had to mail in a money order for four tickets, and then they would send you four tickets back in the mail. You knew that, right? That's you so sketchy, that? man. Like that, yeah. No, that was how they worked. No, but I'm saying, like, what if your tickets got lost, man? No, it like worked Zeppelin. perfectly, because you got four of your buddies. Yeah. And you bought four, you bought four, I bought four, and I bought four. In those days, let's say the yes came. came. They came for five nights. So if you got four tickets for Monday, you got four tickets for Wednesday, you got four for f Thursday, we got to see yes four nights. Yeah. So we went to see him Monday night, and then we go back Friday and go, wow, they were a complete different fucking band. You go yeah. every night, you wouldn't like try to sell the tickets? No. Fuck no. I go every Fuck night. Fuck no. For $8, $10, yeah, 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 we're going to yeah, sell yeah. tickets. Yeah. I thought they were expensive. No, oh, there was no, no way, idiot yeah. standing yeah. online. 850. Yeah. 850, 1250. Yeah. $15.50 was like fucking orchestra seats. Yeah. Like 1950 was at the garden were like all red seats. Fuck you know? that. I go straight to the four. Yeah, straight, straight to, to the, the floor. floor. I always went straight to the that fucking floor. That should be a floor. good shirt, right? Van Halen, straight to straight the floor. Straight to the fucking floor. <laughs> but it's just amazing how different it would have been for that band that was so revolutionary at that time. Right yeah. there, boom. They just came at the Blizzard of Oz struck perfect. That's why they blew up like they did in that time. But it was if they would have had the internet, it would have been a fucking world arena tour because everybody was waiting for this. Yeah. People were waiting for fucking Ozzy to pull the trigger. I guess those last three Sab Sabbath albums, people just didn't really like. I liked them. I loved it. I love Never Say Die and Technical Ecstasy. People, people not Technical Ecstasy. Bro, you know? if you put Technical Ecstasy on Twitter, yeah. people will hit you back. Rule number one of Black Sabbath. What's the thing from Fight Club? Oh, the don't talk rule? about Technical Ecstasy. Don't talk about Ecstasy. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know how many times I've played uh, Don't You Won't Change Me. Yeah. And people have come back and said, rule number one of Black Sabbath. <laughs> Don't talk about technical ecstasy. And I've giggled in the morning going, I, Jesus fucking Christ. I, you know, what's funny is um, I saw Rudy. I was, um, let's see, night I was a f uh, sophomore in high school. Their first super big gig, Dan the Green. They play Oakland. So it's like heart headlining. 
a heart. And this 65,000 people at the Oakland A's Stadium. And I was only going to see, uh, you know, Ozzy. Yeah, we went on, on like 10.30 in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. No. yeah. yeah. But I got to tell you, if, you know, you're talking about the internet and all that, not blowing up. I think that really helped us to keep our shit together. You just think about the gig. Don't think about what everybody else thinks about the band. You know, which is what would happen with the internet. You start getting messages, good or bad or whatever, and then that gets in the way. You spend too much time, you know, uh, you know, uh, online, you know, social media and all. No, just think about the gig. You know, those three hours you're gonna spend on the internet, you're gonna be, <laughs> you're gonna have your guitar on. Yeah, that's you true. Know, that's, no, that makes sense. Also, you know what I mean? We, and, and also, your head doesn't get filled with shit like, oh my god, people are. They heard me play the and and they saw this mistake that I made on in Milwaukee on the third yeah, song. Right. And, and they'll fucking pull out the Yeah, it's, it's like yeah, you don't. No, know it's that, like you're not dealing with anything like that. You know, we used to go to the mall just about every day. Randy and I, we used to go to like you know bookstores to see magazines if they. You know, to see if, if an interview that Ozzy gave three months ago was finally printed. Because that's how long it took. You know, when, when Ozzy, actually one of his first Circus Magazine interviews, that was like three months before, you know, when we were on the road, you know, three months into the tour, that's when the actual, you know, magazine came out. It was printed. Nowadays, it's like, yeah. you know, it's overnight. You know, somebody does an uh, interview or something, just before, post, post the, before the st stage yeah. is packed up, it's already on yeah, online. Yeah, exactly. The whole well, show you know, is probably all of that. And, and, and you're so caught up in what, what he said this, he, he said that, or people are thinking about what we're doing. No, you just, back in the day, 1981, we didn't, we didn't know. We just kept moving. You know, yeah. we, we did a show today, and well, tomorrow we got another show, and we're going to get up there and kick ass again. That's all, that's all we were concerned with. Well, that gave you time to grow, too, and, and, uh, and organically to become this uh, killer fucking band. Because if you were reading stuff, you might start second-guessing things. Yeah, you might start believing your own hype. Yeah. You know, uh, Hendrix has one of my favorite quotes. Uh, it's, uh, I don't like... Uh, uh, compliments <laughs> they, they you know they get in the way of, of, of my playing I fucking hate them you know Hendrix I fucking <laughs> oh, hate them. no I love Hendrix compliments I hate oh compliments. compliments oh yeah yeah, yeah. after a fucking yeah. show I fucking they drive yeah. me crazy yeah. uh, you know they, all that shit yeah. drives me fucking yeah. crazy because yeah. only you know how good you yeah. were you, you know, really do it's your expectation yes you <laughs> yeah Yes, yeah. you fucking Yeah, we know. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> well, we walk off. Yeah. Yeah. And they go, that was the greatest. And you're like, no. Nah. No, no. That was, exactly. that yeah. was, no. That was yeah. pretty. Uh, I call Lee all the time. And Lee will say, how'd you do? I ate shit. Really? I yeah. can't figure that out. Yeah. And I know if Lee was there, Lee go, you didn't eat shit. But in my mind. Yeah. I ate shit. I stumbled through this. I stumbled through that. It's. Uh, Does it affect you when you make a mistake? Like anyway. It could be one a mistake that is so. Small that if you hear back the uh, the playback of that show, you you cannot even hear it, but it sticks in your mind for the whole, the rest of the rest of the evening, and every other note is, is correct. Just that one note that you maybe like, so it might be like a little flub, that you you know it's it's it within what you play like ten thousand notes in a show, and it's that that one. Yeah, they go oh shit, you know. It's like yeah. that with jokes when you. When you do the joke, just a oh, hair wrong. A you hair you wrong. did the punchline first by accident or something. You're like, <laughs> oh, I'm fucked here. I just ruined the joke. And I'll tell them. I'll stop <coughs> yeah, and tell yeah, them. Me too. Listen, I just fucked up that joke disregarded. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. they'll get a laugh and we laugh and we all know. We all yeah. make mistakes. That makes you human. That yeah. makes you them. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Now you're even yeah. doing better because, yeah. all right, I made a mistake. Fuck okay, it. Let's you guys, as, it's, you know, comedians, what you do. Do you sometimes stretch it out? Because we do that as musicians. You know, we, we don't play exactly the same thing every night. Sometimes you go like, oh, let me try this other, you know, pentatonic riff or whatever, you know, maybe in a different position or something. You guys do variations every, like that? Oh, absolutely. Oh, every absolutely. night it's different. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. I can't go on stage and do the exact fucking night after night after night. No way. I got to switch it up. And if one night I get rid of a bit, so fucking be it. If some night somebody gets hit with a glass and I riff on it, it's funny for 20 minutes. Fuck it. They got their money's worth a different way. We still laughed about something. Totally. You know, I like to be in the moment. I love for something to happen. I don't have to tell jokes. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, yeah like Bill Hicks would say, the act is last. You what, know what I mean? What would be your equivalent of jamming? Because, you know, in a band, you know... You, crowd work. 
crowd, oh, with the crowd, crowd works no. jamming. Oh, okay. it's riffing. Crowd work. This guy's killer at it. Man. I used to be really, really good at it. Yeah, but it didn't get you nowhere. It doesn't. It caused too much commotion. And comics that follow you now, you leave them open to talk to him. Yeah. So you have to be really careful with it. If you develop in New York for some reason, you do it a lot more to kill material. And I was doing it for a long time, and then I had to stop. Sometimes, if I'm rocking and rolling and I got them already, then you fuck around a little bit. You know what I'm saying? You just go. Not mm-hmm. every show, though. You do it like maybe once every f- 10 shows I see. Yeah. You. No, it's terrible because I don't want to. It was such a bad habit. Yeah. You know, the worst thing you could do is anything. A musician uh, is pick up a bad habit. When I was a basketball player, I used to take the rebound. I used to be a great rebounder, but I'd get the rebound and put it on the floor. Why the fuck are you bouncing the fucking ball? Yeah. It took years to break that habit. And I saw it how, as a comic, you get into a fucking habit, and boom, you know, for a long time I had this habit of wanting silence. Who, what comic wants silence? Yeah. Because I was testing them. I would try to test. <laughs> we just go through so many phases. Yeah. And you try so many fucking different things, and you have to. To stay who you oh, yeah, are, yeah, you yeah. have to try yeah. different fucking things. Yeah, yeah. I just, yeah. I'm more conscious of them yeah. now because people are paying for the tickets. Yeah. Yeah. Do you understand me? Yeah, yeah. I'm more conscious yeah. now. Yeah. You know, when I go to the comedy, it used to be that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you went to the yeah. comedy store, I wouldn't even think about it down the road because I wanted that organic joke to come out. Yeah. There's nothing yeah. like uh, there's nothing like 40 people, which is 80 set of eyes looking at you, pressure. You know, it's like um, I stated something when I watched the Ronda Rousey fight that you could tell that she didn't get punched in the face during practice. Mm-hmm. Nobody hit her. Mm-hmm. It's equivalent to a comic doing material in front of a mirror. Nothing bad's going to happen to you. You're going to do great every time. It's like you, it's like when you beat up a punching bag. Who loses? Yeah. Who yeah. loses to a punching bag? Yeah. You got to get out there. Yeah. You know, you got to get out there. Yeah. I can't imagine how a band does it. Like everybody in note every night, tight. And sure, the, the tour starts a little fucked up. But after a year, always does, always does. But yeah. after yeah. a year, yeah. Jesus fucking yeah. Christ, machine, yeah. Jesus yeah. fucking Christ, <laughs> yeah. you know. Man. Yeah. And then Every, I, 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 sorry, yeah. I'm sorry. How do you? Because when it's Joey or or Dean, you can make a decision to change your jo- joke. You don't tell anybody. You guys, do you do you have a signal, or how do you let them know during a show when there's fifty thousand people cheering? How do you say, "Oh, I'm going to go a little bit long here," or do you plan it? Uh. That's a really good question. I got to tell you, if you're in a band, you're playing for in front of 50,000 people, every show is going to be the same every night. And I'll tell you why, because of production. And once the production got huge and automated, technology came in and all the lighting directors, you know, there, there's actually guys, the LDs, who actually come in and they not only program, but they create a stage show. Very rarely does the guy who actually creates the production goes on tour with the band. I know a few, but mostly there's guys who make a living out of, you know, they get a phone call from band A, and he goes there and designs the, all the lighting, the lighting rig, everything. He'll program it, and it's the, the guy who goes on the road, his job is to push buttons and make, you know, he, he, he might stop the, uh, the, the lighting sequence between songs, but usually it's all rigged, which means that you, as a musician, you have to know where to stand, a spot on stage, every song, every section of the song, because otherwise you're going to be dark. Yeah, bombs and yeah. fire, too. Oh, yeah. It's all oh, timed. Yeah. All oh, those yeah. fire and bombs, Absolutely. smoke. Absolutely. So there's <clears throat> no room for, for uh, jamming, you know, uh, because everything is, it, the bigger the band, the bigger the production, the more constraints you have as a musician to do everything exactly the same night and a lot of bands have backup tracks backing tracks so that's it. that's even more restrictions there because you got to be start the song and end the song exactly this on on the same bar every night they play to a metronome and these background vocals trigger right yeah. on the spot. Yeah. It's called radar. It runs perfectly with the yeah. song. So if yeah. you're off a little, the backgrounds would come on later. Shout exactly. Out the you know, yeah. you're like, oh, yeah. fuck. Yeah. So, you know, things started changing back around the middle of the 80s when, when bands started getting automated productions. Before that, you know, like when, when I was working with, with uh, you know, with, with Ozzy, 
even uh, Blizzard of Oz. It was just a bunch of guys get up there and you start the song. Sometimes Ozzy will walk off the stage and disappear. Yeah, and a couple of dudes with those spotlights. Remember, they'd climb up before the show. Yeah. That's how you knew the show was yeah. starting, remember? Yeah. The guys would go up those yeah. those scary-ass rope ladders and be up there with their fucking spots, yeah. and that was the lighting. Yeah, yeah. You know? It's so, yeah, super, all right, yeah. so I saw you in April of 81, and then Randy died in May of 82? Uh, March. March 19th, of 82. 82, yeah. And then the tour came back to my hometown with yeah. Brad yeah. Gillis. Willis. Uh, Brad Gillis. Which show was that? Uh, Diary of a Madman. They yeah. played the Meadowlands. Meadowlands, yeah, Brad. And yeah. it was fucking a yeah. different stage. Yeah. Because yeah, I remember yeah. at yeah, the Palladium, yeah. there's not yeah. much you could fucking yeah. do. It was a picture yeah. of Ozzy, yeah. some dragons and whatever. <laughs> but once you got to the Meadowlands that yeah. October... The fucking tank opened up and the castle and yeah. now that you yeah. can't stretch. You know, you watch uh, VH1 every every other Friday. They got the song remains the same. Oh, yeah, I love that. And they edited it down and they cut it and they put tracks in it and the whole thing. But you could see they were just up there, but there was no production value. No production, right? There yeah. was two explosions yeah. during... Uh, Moby think, Dick or yeah, something. Yeah, no, no quarter. Yeah. Oh, know, yeah, yeah. Bah, and, all, and there was the fucking wah-wah thing with the yeah. hand. Yeah. Yeah. Beside that, they would just look at each other and just fucking go, right? Yeah. Bonham would just control the show. Those guys would jam. Yeah. They just jammed, jam. you know. Jam. Jam. That's not going to happen today where, you know, you're going to come up. Yeah. We were talking about curfews. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Or union. We were, union curfews, you, yeah. you know. Yeah. It's triple the, time. Triple time. The, gr so the green coats in the garden. You know, I remember going to the, the garden and seeing yeah. the new barbarians, and they went on till fucking 12. Fuck yeah. the union, you know, but that cost. You don't yeah. realize it. But then you go years later to see Don Henley at uh, Fiddler's Green, and you got to be off by 945. Those white people will fucking call the cops on you, dog. Yeah. They pull the plug yeah. right in the middle of the fucking song. Yeah. yeah. Red Rocks is very nice. They got a fucking curfew, too, up there. Yeah. It's so weird yeah. how you figure somebody goes up there and goes, listen, we're pulling a Dave Chappelle. Yeah. yeah. We're yeah. doing every fucking song we ever wrote, okay? Backwards. Yeah. We're yeah. here till 2 in the morning. Yeah. Call Earl sick style. right now. They yeah. played every rec song they ever wrote one concert. Every song. It was like eight records or something. They did it. <laughs> Every that, House of Blues that I played at, there's, there's, a, there's a clock on the side of the stage. Right, yeah, 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 yeah. everywhere. Yeah. That's everywhere. Yeah. yeah, and if you go over one minute, yeah. you start ducking like, you know, $1,000. Tri triple time. <laughs> yeah. For, it's amazing. That's the House of Blues. You know? Yeah. 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 You know, there's something really yeah. weird going on lately with music that I've been read not reading about. I just heard things about what's going on with the Eagles. Something's fucked up. They're receiving an award, but I guess they told the oh, poor long-haired his... guy he can't show up. Yeah, and they—I mean, the guy wrote Hotel California. Something I mean, happened to Glenn right. Fry though. He's getting a surgery, and uh, <clears throat> he said from years of partying or whatever, he had to go in and get a surgery, and they're going to get the award uh, next time. They pushed it a year, so he went into surgery. Google, uh, Google that Glenn Fry surgery recently. Something happened to him, but yeah, the other guy, Don Feldner's out. Like, and yeah. he's fucking oh, yeah. Yeah, filter, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> like he's like I, I don't know what I did, you know. He's but if he's, you watch that documentary, you see him fucking up throughout the thing. You know, he wants to sing. I'm a singer. <laughs> like when they get to the long run record, and you know, everybody wants. Well, the the thing was, they promised him they were going to sing. Yeah, they always promised him a song. Yep. And I guess they pulled him out of the studio for lunch, and they had what's his name, Don Henley, Don sing. Henley sing. And then they said, "Why would we have you sing when we have Don Henley?" Yeah, and he <laughs> said that uh, he. But they also said that would come back to haunt him. Yeah. And then when they got back, you know, when they got back or something, something they went out as uh, they weren't really a band anymore. They were something like employees. Oh, yeah. Like hired four guns. of them were the band, and Don Felder became the employee. That was when Hell he, Freezes Over Tour 96. And that's what he told him. He goes, this is the deal that you do. I mean, they don't like him at all. You could see. And I figured he's like the guy that's still doing drugs. Like, they showed up to rehearsal, like, with the bottle, and they're like, uh, we got short hair now. <laughs> we got you know short hair now. We got our money suits on. Uh, <laughs> you brought Budweiser? I, I came in a Lamborghini. Yeah, bro. you know. He showed up in a fucking Z28 and a 12-pack, like, we're back. <laughs> Z28. We're back. <laughs> and the Eagles are like, uh, we're getting 250 a ticket. Yeah. You Please. find it? Yeah, it, it's it, exactly what you said. It just due to all of his partying, he needed to push it back a year. Yeah, a whole year. So something's wrong with him. 
<coughs> he said he was going in to get a surgery, you know. Well, they only award those things once. Yeah, a year. once a year, the like, Kennedy honors. Yeah, Kennedy's in the Kennedy's honors. Honors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what it was. They think that they feel that everybody should show. Randy Meisner, yeah. everybody should show, but the Eagles are like, nah. I feel it's that just too. Four of us. I feel that uh, anybody that was there to keep you going through the eras should be up there, even with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You know, you can't. Uh, I mean, when it came down to the Kiss guys, you know, uh, you got Peter and Ace definitely should be there and they should play together. You know, don't you think so? I don't know. I think Kiss is really an anomaly. Yeah. Because it's kind of like a. Uh, it's kind of like a, like a team, and a team by that I mean is uniforms. Right. There's a Kiss uniform, which is the their costume, their costumes, and the makeup, and it's even there, there's a copyright to That's to right. those things, right? And well, look at Kiss without the makeup, business wise. Yeah. Wasn't as big as Kiss with the makeup when they got back together again with the makeup, and I mean we're talking different between. As a matter of fact, Kiss supported White Snake in 1990 with other makeup. They come back with a, with a makeup and they're headlining Dodger Stadium. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's, that's really an anomaly right. in the business. I'm just talking about Rock and Roll Hall of Fame or, what, or awards where guys right. were on records and wrote songs and stuff. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. From that point, yeah, yeah. as far as musical contribution. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, ha I would have to imagine that. Isn't the love is so big for those people you were talking about that the hate would probably be just as big? If you hated somebody, you're probably not going to yeah, want to be in but the same room as them. When you, as a band, get into a room and decide, listen, guys, we're going to be completely different from everybody else, rewrite some of the rules of rock and roll and the music industry, and we're going to put these outfits on, that's really going to separate you from everybody. And that, to me, that becomes a, a corporation. That's a business decision to do that. They, they, they say, listen, we can't really compete with Led Zeppelin or whoever because we're not, we might not be as, as good as they are. But what we can do is create this. And they created this yeah. mega, you know, corporation, KISS. Yeah. It's a show. It's a show. It's a show. It's yeah. what it is, yep. you know. And it's, to me, yeah, they're, they're really good players. I think Gene is a really good bass player. He, I, I think he's really underrated. Yeah. Uh, but business-wise, that was genius. That's where the genius of Kiss really lies, in creating Kiss. The whole Kiss is, is the Kiss world, Kiss empire. Incredible, yeah. right? Even yeah. the manager, genius. Bill O'Coin. Genius. That I mean, guy's just fucking, you the know. The whole thing is totally genius. Never done again. I mean, tried to, but yeah. never like, you know. Never. I never. mean, you couldn't do it now. Because of TMZ and shit. You never saw those guys' faces That's for right. like 10 years. That's right. It was just bandanas. I tell you, when I, when I uh, moved to L.A. in the mid-70s, I, I got a job at a place called McNaturals right across from Tower Records on Sunset. And on my first day, I'm learning the, uh, the register, you know, and, I'm like, and I look up, and there's Paul Stanley. You we, knew it was him? Uh, I, well, he looked like Paul Stanley w without the makeup. Wow. And I'm like, oh, I, 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 you know, like, oh, my God. And so he orders, he's ordered the same thing every, every, at every time that he came in. It was a uh, Wonder of the Orient, which was a Brussels sprout and salad with a uh, scoop of tuna and a, a, a small carrot juice. He had that every single time. He wow, came in, you your know? memory is incredible. I love yeah, it. Yeah. Like when yeah, I had you yeah. on the podcast, he can drop dates yeah. and and uh, you know. Well, how many no. times did Paul Stanley come into your? Uh, I know, I know, <laughs> I know. But I mean, you got lunch. a great, you got a great memory, man. Because sometimes I start yeah. getting foggy. It was yeah. like, what year is that? You know what I mean? It's <laughs> like I saw Sabbath and, and Ozzy or whatever, but then I only know like maybe one or two years because of when Blizzard and Diary came out. After that, you're like, I don't know. It was in the 80s or 90s, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, I was thinking about the end of the, when I was in New York last week. I was driving and Heaven and Hell came on. And I thought about how much I wanted to hate that fucking album. Like as a true Ozzy fan. Like when, when they split, like I was going with Ozzy. Like yeah. fuck Black Sabbath. All right, fuck Black Sabbath. I don't need this shit in my life. <laughs> and Heaven and Hell came out, the album. And I remember like, I ain't buying that shit. 
And then, like, Guy Tabasco, the Tabasco family next door, they all had long hair and then went to Van Halen. They bought it. And they were like, you got to listen to the album. Dog, I'm not listening to this shit. There was no more of an album than I wanted to fail in that album. And today I love the fucking album. Oh, love the album. Fell lo- and Dio bothered me. First time I saw Dio was in Philadelphia at the Spectrum with Shaken Street oh. and what's his name? The singer from Van Halen. Oh, the uh, one who replaced Sammy Hagar. Sammy Hagar and Shaken Street and Ronnie Montrose. Wow. And, and I drove from Jersey to Philly. And was my- it Gamma? The band Gamma, Monster no, Band? No, oh, no, okay. it was Ronnie Montrose. And then I saw him again open up for ACDC at the Nassau Coliseum. Yeah. Ronnie Montrose, but he it was it's so weird. I was Montrose, Shaking Street, and they were spitting at Sammy Hagar. Because <laughs> Philadelphia, they got no class. They're savages, those people. At the Spectrum, they would and, and they couldn't spit long range. <laughs> so they would spit on their fingers and flick it. Oh. And you would see Sammy Hagar singing and the spit flying over. And then Dio came out, no. and they opened up with War Pigs, and I was insulted. Yeah. Like, I'm like, what is he doing? And I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? And we had six-row tickets, and my friend did purple. He thought it was acid, but he fell asleep at the show. So for years, we kept saying, dog, remember the time we did those purple lutes? They weren't fucking lutes. They were acid, asshole. I was tired. <laughs> but when he came out, he's like, generals gathered in the masses. Yeah. Just I'm like, no, we gotta go. <laughs> we gotta go, dog. We gotta go. This guy's out there fucking butchering Ozzy. Uh, I was furious. He was yeah. a short little guy, yeah. Dio, yeah. dressed in black. And, Jen, and then they did war pigs and he did something different. Yeah. Like it was different. And I was into, let's give this guy a shot. And then he stole my heart, man. In uh-huh. a weird way, Dio had me competing. You know, it was yeah. a, it was the album you wanted to fucking hate with everything I got. You know, I wanted to hate it. I ended up seeing the tour like two times. And yeah. Well, we up. got lucky they broke up because we got four masterpiece records. We got The Blizzard, Diary, um, uh, Mob Rules, and Heaven and Hell. So she Mob Rules, I had already tapped Oh, out. no, that fucking yeah. record really? is actually masterpiece. Also, uh, the Dehumanizer. Uh, dehumanizer. Dehumanizer. That's an amazing we get, record. F- we get five fucking yeah. records. Who was Dehumanizer? Uh, it was right after yeah. uh, Mob Rules. He really? left, well, he uh, left uh, for a minute, well, yeah. They got Ian Gillen, Ian, and yeah. then he comes back and they do Dehumanizer. Yeah. Which, by the way. Is it really good? Oh, oh yeah. And I'll tell you what. Well, I was tremendous, done. Tremendous. What year was that? Oh, I don't know. Late 80s? Yeah, late, late 80s. 80s because okay, because I remember still uh, Lonely good. Diver, whatever the fuck. Oh, well, he, he that's his soul. Stuff. That's his yeah, soul. That yeah. was 83. Yeah, you got Holy Diver. Yeah, whatever was in 83. Last in, I list, last in Line, all that shit. We should, yeah. we should yeah. let you listen to it for the first time. What's a good song from Dehumanizer? Oh, oh no, uh, play Dehumanizer, the actual song. Yeah, yeah It's like the unbelievable. Dehumanizer. Really? Yeah, yeah. check well, it yeah. out. What year was Yeah, 89, I was doing <laughs> yeah. something different. Yeah. I was also, people up and shit. I tell, I talk about this record over and over and over and over. Born again, which everyone hated, and I saw the tour. It was Ian Gillen in in Sabbath. I, hands down, one of my favorite records ever made. Really? And I saw the tour. It was empty at the Cow Palace, and it was really weird and, and a weird vibe. But I loved it, man. When we were on the bill, yeah. it was sold out every single night. Unbelievable. Yeah. That I mean, we band. mean Quiet Riot. Yeah, I mean, yeah, right, we, we right. We were the opening band for, for them on the East Coast. Now, How great was, was that record? 83. Yeah. Here you go. Here's some Dehumanizer. Show them what the cover looks like. This is Sabbath. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Yeah. it's great. Listen. Let's go high. High. Yeah, high. You used to play that with Ronnie. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is yeah. too much. Yeah. Great. I'll be smoking okay. some bong hits yeah. tonight listening yeah. to this How shit. great is yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, we used to do that song with uh, with Ronnie on, on tour called I. Yeah. I, I. <laughs> it's incredible. I wouldn't even dare even try, you know, yeah. to sing, you know. It would be so funny. We, we, we would be, you know, with, uh, touring with Dio, and we used to do a lot of uh, uh, Scandinavian, uh, you know, countries, Finland and so on, you know. And Finland, it, they're very 
in Norway are very well known for for like black metal. You know, the the bands that go in and burn churches down yeah, and yeah, yeah. and like you know they'll, if they have a chick singer, she sings like <laughs> you know, Cookie like, Monster. You know, yeah, Cookie Monster, chick singer. You know, <laughs> and and so. <laughs> They would always, you know, come in and pay respects, you know, to Ronnie. You know, after their show, they would come in and, and into our dressing room and say, Oh, Ronnie, you're, you're the reason why I sing, <laughs> you know. Oh, that's hilarious. And Ronnie would like, always oh, shake your hand, be polite, and then they would leave and go, Do I sound like that? <laughs> I'll tell you what. Mob Rules has Dio's best song ever, Sign of the Southern Cross. Oh, my God. It's his best song yeah. ever. Yeah. And if you don't know it, no, I remember the album. I'm listening the actual to song times, "Sign of the Southern Cross" yeah. is the most yeah. epic Dio song ever. Check it out. It's falling off the edge of the world. That's another. Oh one. That's yeah, one. yeah. Children the, of the Sea. Oh my. These it, ones where they're really kind of ballady, and he can get yeah. into it. When when uh, when Ronnie joined uh, Heaven and Hell, the band Heaven and Hell, which is you know Black Sabbath by another name, you know. Uh, we stopped playing Black Sabbath songs, so we actually went deeper into the Dio catalog and Rainbow catalog. Where that's that's another oh. incredible oh. Ronnie James Dio era. Terra Woman. Oh my, Terra Woman. We, just, we Are used you to open up with me? that. Yeah. He only did two albums with Rainbow. I right? think three. Three. Yeah. Two yeah. or yeah. three. Three. Yeah. three. Yeah. Stargazer. Uh, that would be the first one. That's the yeah. first one. With the original, well, actually, with Elf. Elf. Yeah. Elf. The Elf band without the original guitar player. Yeah. And then uh, Rainbow Rising and, yeah, yeah. and, and uh, Long Live Rock and Roll. That's it, Long yeah. Live Rock and Roll. It's yeah. the huge one. That's yeah. a good one. Huge. Yeah. But Terra Woman. I remember one day <laughs> I was going down the road in my car with satellite radio, and I go, what Dio song is this? I don't, I've had all yeah. the Dio. And I was like, holy yeah. shit, Rainbow. Yeah. And it's only like four ninety nine on iTunes right now, that record. It's, uh, it's got Terra Woman, you know, and it's like six songs, and it's an incredible Rainbow record. Yeah. Oh. And, and the genius of uh, Richie Blackmore. Oh, what an leads. underrated guitar player. Because everybody talks about Jeff Beck and Eric Clapton and Jimmy Page. Check out Richie Blackmore. Were you friends with him? With who? Richie? No, I, ne I never met him. What did you hear about him personally? From Ronnie, they had the greatest sense of humor ever. Wow. Yeah. He said he was the funniest guy ever to be around. Yeah. Why didn't he ever keep a singer? Yeah, that's crazy. That's what I, I never, I never got. Yeah, Tony Bennett, why the fuck <laughs> didn't he ever keep a singer? I don't know. I, I, I always heard little rumblings of him. Or what? Is he alive still? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, he's coming yeah. out this yeah. summer. He got yeah. a new singer, and they're doing Rainbow. Yeah. Here you go. Oh, Tony Bennett? I want to be around. <laughs> I was all, here's sign of the Southern Cross. <laughs> <laughs> when no, I just, uh, somebody breaks. You know, I let go of music. Like once I, I went into the world, it yeah. was over for me. I had to dive in. I had no more time to sit there. The yeah. shit I was doing, I had to dive in, dog. There was no time. I hear you. To I put hear an you. Album on You're on days. the streets. So I had lost that whole, uh, yeah. that whole music thing in my life. I was lost. You know, I didn't get back into music till Guns N' Roses, Appetite for Destruction. That woke me up out of my musical mm -hmm. coma. And I still didn't go see him or nothing. It was just something that I listened to. I bought that a couple albums, but I was lost for a long time. Without. Good record to bring you back. Yeah. Man. You know. I talked to, uh, I, I, what's amazing about Rudy is what people don't know is, and I had him on the podcast, is they were the first band, Quiet Riot. They opened the door for Motley Crue and everything after it. Well, they say that one of the best document series right now. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Even yeah. one of my friends said it is phenomenal. It is just, it really breaks down. I guess they had the number one single of all time or the heaviest metal album. First band, man. The, the first metal, what was you, because metal today is very different from what was considered metal, metal back then, 30 right. years ago. You know, it has evolved. So we were considered metal. Uh, and we were the first debut record to reach number one. See, I always thought that Led Zeppelin and everybody else had done that. Thriller. No. They knocked Thriller off knocked, the charts. Yeah, yeah, we had to <coughs> knock Thriller off the number one spot to get to number one. Yeah. Huh. We were selling a million a week. Yeah. He said you know. they were, remember those masks? That yeah. Kevin oh, yeah, 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 yeah. They yeah, were yeah. selling a, a million of those masks on tour. On the tour. Kevin DeBro yeah. mask. Yeah. 
Unbelievable. A million? No, this is well, 83. Okay, okay, check this out. Back in the day, uh, the average was about 750 a head merchandise. You know, so if you have 10,000 people in the arena, the average it averaged out to 75 grand a night in merchandising. Without credit cards, we're talking cash. And would you would the band get that? Well, it was our money, and then you know we would pay whatever uh, to the merchandising company. You know they would take a uh, make the a percentage. And this is before the time when when like uh, you know now you have like Life Nation. They own a lot of the uh, venues, and they take about thirty to forty percent of your merchandising money. Back then, yeah. they didn't know. Yeah, they didn't. It was you just clean. set up your yeah. shirts and walked with your cash. They yeah. take 40% of your shirts? Oh, yeah. Now? Yeah, merchandise. Oh, you yeah. guys should just like, give them a card to your website then. That's too much to give up. Yeah. Well, well, here's the thing. Now, also, record deals are done on 360 deals mm -hmm. because there's no record sales. So when you sign a record deal now, you give the label part of your merch, your touring, and, and your record sales. Yeah. Oh. Or if you, you know, like, uh, for example, Life Nation and all these other companies that have a deal where they actually buy your record. You know, you make, a, you make a record, and then they buy your record. They give you a set amount of money for your tour and the merchandise. So they own everything. You just have to show up and, and do your gig. An all-in deal. Yeah. So yeah. a lot of times you'll tell the guy, hey, put yeah. me on the list. Like a huge band, like say Madonna, and they go, "Yeah, I got to pay for your ticket." Exactly, because they've yeah. been paid one lump sum for the tour. Yeah. Well, the Stones were one of the first yeah. ones to do that. Exactly. That, that's auctions. how I know about yeah. it so much. Yeah, you know, used to have auctions, and and the, whoever the promoter won the auction, he bought yeah. every, he owned every every seat. Every so seat. So if you were Keith Richards and you wanted your your uncle to come to the show, you had to buy that ticket because you were paid yeah. a lump sum up front. Yeah. It's pretty wild. Yeah. Like people would be like. What do you mean you don't got no guest list? You go, yeah, you, you really want that guy to come if he's in your seat, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy how the music industry has just changed completely. And it mm -hmm. still fucks you guys. It's still out to fuck you guys. It's well, never it's, been it, a, it always has. It, that, it's yeah. never been, music has never been a fucking yeah. paradise on yeah. your end. Yeah. You hear the stories and you go, what? Oh. What are you talking about? Yeah. These guys sold more records than anybody. What was the label? Quiet Riot, the first one? The uh, Pasha? Pasha? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. You know. and I still, in order for me to get my money, I have to call my lawyer, which costs me money, to get my money. <laughs> so, yeah, they gave me my money eventually at some point, but I got to pay my lawyer for that. You know, a lot of money. For, like, years he didn't get paid. He had to battle to get it. Oh, God, yeah. For about... Seven years, we were, uh, you know, we had to go to court. Okay, so it's yeah. 1983. Yeah. Quiet Riot gets this album ready. Yeah. Get, break it down for me. Break it down from A to fucking Z. Break down it's the what? Which, you don't have to tell me figures. Which process? Just break down how it happens. You guys have your eight songs. <laughs> who was the album? Who was the label? Uh, it was Pasha Records. Distributed. Who, was, who else did they have, Pasha, at the time? They had Billy something, Billy... Billy Squire? No, Billy... Ocean? Something, no, something Children of the Sun, Billy... Billy. Yeah, Ch Children of the Sun. Yeah, yeah, I know that <laughs> tune. Yeah. All right, so they had yeah. Pasha. Yeah. Who was the distri distributor? Uh, interesting, because Pasha, as a production company, had distribution through different labels. One of them was Capital. Okay. Ours happened to be with, uh, with uh, CBS okay. Epic okay. at the time. Okay, so now... Yeah. Yeah. You get the album. You sit down. We're going to do the album. How much do you get paid for the album? There's five guys in the band. Four. Four. Yeah. Randy Rhodes. No, no, no. Randy was... <coughs> Randy oh, was, yeah. I mean, but original... Yeah. Original... Well, no, 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 no. We're talking about this Oh, yeah. Let's talk about Carlos Cavazza. Carlos. Let's talk about Frankie, this first. Frankie, Carlos, Kevin, and me. Okay. So yeah. there's four guys. Do yeah. they pay you to, sh to tape the, the, the album? No. It was all done on demo time. Demo is uh, Pasha owned the studio. And let's say you canceled a, a, a session. Uh, the engineer will call you know, one of the guys and say, hey, listen, we got time open for you guys to come in. Because we didn't have a deal yet. It was all done on spec. Spec time, it's spec called. Spec time, yeah. So, which, you know, after you get signed, that's when you pay for, for the studio time. It's in right. good faith. They're thinking yeah. you're going to get a deal. You get a little heat, yeah. and they go, look, this band has heat. Yeah. We want to use your studio in the middle of the night, like 2 a.m. We'll pay if they get a deal. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. I see where it goes. Yeah, Speculation. Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. spec deal. Okay. Yep. So now you and the boys got a call, and you went in. How long to lay the album down? 
Well, you days. know what? While while the guys were laying down basic tracks, I was still in Ozzy. So my the first time that I walked in the studio to to record on the album was to do one song called Thunderbird that I used to play with Kevin in his band Dubro, and then uh, when Randy passed away. Uh, he asked me to come in to do that as a uh, tribute to Randy on the record. And so I, that was the first song I recorded. Then we had extra time, and the guy said, listen, do you remember Slick Black Cadillac, uh, Let's Get Crazy? You know, songs that I... Uh, Slick Black, I used to play with Randy in Quiet Riot, and then we did that in Dubrow. And then uh, Let's Get Crazy and the other songs, which I already knew from Dubrow. So by the time I left, I, I had laid down like four or five songs, from the album, but I was still Ozzy's bass player, you know? And, and again, you know, getting back to the thing about playing from pain, it was very painful for me after Randy died, you know, to keep playing with Ozzy, you know? So I, here I am with the guys from Quiet Riot, you know, Kevin and Frankie and, and Carlos, and, and I said, God, you know, this feels good. I, I feel like, yeah, this is like a joy. I just joy in my playing again, you know, which is what I, what I wanted in my life, you know? So I, I li uh, here I am. I leave one of the biggest bands in the world, Ozzy, for like the total unknown, Quiet Riot. You know, that's how much pain I had. Which, or by that, the way, he, what he's not saying is no one wanted Quiet Riot. Well, yeah. For years. So it's, yeah. a, it's a gamble. Well, not only Quiet Riot, but the whole music scene. Yeah, the you heavy know, metal. Yeah, 1982, L.A. It was all, you know, new the wave. Knack. Yeah, new wave from punk. That was it. If you were not in, in a new wave or a punk band, record companies didn't want to know anything about you. you know? uh, when, when you said that Quiet Riot opened the, the door, what happened was Quiet Riot created, a, 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 uh, 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 created some, some sort of, within the industry, a, uh, opened the eyes of the executives that there is a market for rock bands. And so, you know, just like it happened with Nirvana in Seattle, you know, they record, com a record companies locally in Los Angeles are saying, hey, these guys came from the Strip. Who else is on the Strip? Well, you have Motley Crue who's been around, and you got Rat, and you got uh, Dokken, and then Gray White, and so on. So, okay, well, these guys are ready to go. Let's sign them up, too, and, you know, promote them and make MTV videos and so on. So, basically, that's what happened. It's not like, like we, you know, we invented anything. You know, we were there but so were the other guys ready to go, you know. So that opened the door as far as, like, creating an awareness that the, that type of music that we were all doing, there was a market for, you know. And something that I, I got a glimpse of it because it was already happening in England and Europe, you know, with bands like Saxon. You know, Ozzy opened up for Saxon in 1981. That was part of our Diary of a Madman tour, you know, in, in October of 1981, October, November. Uh, we also, we, we had Motorhead, we had Def Leppard, so I was aware of like Maiden. Uh, Maiden, Maiden, Maiden was another band, you know, all, all those guys that later became MTV staple. That's another thing, MTV. MTV was responsible for creating all of that. Lightning yeah. in a bottle, right? Right place at the right it time. Was, all right, so now you put this album <laughs> down. Yeah. They do the cover with the fucking masks. Just yeah. come on, feel the noise. Yep. Correct. Well, okay. that was the second, second single, second video. First one was Metal wow. Health. Yeah. Bang right, your so now, head. When do you see a dollar? When does your first dollar come in? At this time. Yeah, you I. As a matter of fact, the guys were getting gas money during the making of the record. There was no advances, no nothing. It was a production deal. It was like you go, you you record the record, and we're gonna try to put this out with a major label as a distributor, you know, marketing, promotion, all of that. So there was no advances, nothing, you know, which meant that we recoup immediately. You know, I think it, it, the cost of the album was like thirty-two grand. Yeah. To tape. To yeah. Do the course. That was it. Okay. Yeah. Including electricity and and tape and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Thirty-two, which meant that we recoup really fast but also you have to take into consideration when you sign a production deal it's it's the difference between a cake and a, and a and a muffin the cake being the big the big pot where everything comes out of you know and then a production deal is a percentage of the production deal not a percentage of the deal because you have the uh, the major label being the big pot the big piece you know the the big slice. So our slice was smaller because it was predicated from the production deal. You know. 
side man. It's like a middleman deal. A middleman deal. So yeah. now, yeah, part of the contract is they give you money and then album sale money, correct? To the band as yeah. a whole, or just the writers of the songs? Oh no, no, no. Yeah, rec record sales. Yeah. For life, you get this. Well, we still do. Okay. Yeah. Because I met people in Boulder yeah. who were radio cops. Yeah. Yeah. That there's two guys in Boulder. That's what they did for a living. They made sure you guys got your money. Like I mean, ASCAP guys? Well, yeah. ASCAP and BMI, yeah. 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 And now yeah. it's done, it's different. Everything, old songs are coded, and yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's a different world. I mean, now we, I, I make money from, um, from uh, airplay, and we didn't before. Musicians never used to make money from airplay. Now uh, anything being uh, what, the, what they call non-terrestrial broadcast, uh, we'll make money from airplay. Yeah, it could be it could be computer, XM, Sirius XM, whatever, satellite. Yeah. I met somebody in Hollywood fifteen years ago. Nice kid. And one day I asked him, Don't you work? And he goes, Yeah, I'm on tour with the band that, that used to jump up and down, not the fucking guys from Orange County. I'm gonna have so hard, we're so hard in the end. It really doesn't matter. Not those guys. Oh, but before them, Park before or? them, there was a guy in the guitar Three doors play, down. and he was big, and they jumped around, and he was. They were gonna make a comeback, and they were huge. I don't know the name. Sugar Ray, but like a Sugar Ray. -ish. Right. He was a good-looking guy. He was kind of bald. He was in a band, and he was dating strippers. He was. And, oh, oh, the guys. Uh, and now he Crazy Town. No, and now they do something it's else. Lincoln Park. No, it's not Lincoln Park. It, it was, doesn't really matter? I, uh, yeah, I know it's that was Lincoln them, Park. It was around that area. Anyway, uh -huh. to make a long story short, yeah. they were on tour. They were big, and he's, he's producing now. They kept threatening to come back with a new guitarist for a long time. Limp Biscuit. Limp Biscuit. Oh, there you go. Okay, yeah. what's the yeah. guy's name? Yeah. Wes Arkeen. Yeah, I mean, no, Wes... Mon uh, monkey. They have mon Monkey... Uh, no, that's like Corn. Wes Borland. With, with, no, and Fred, Fred Durst. Durst. What was the name? Fred Durst. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What was the guy with the mask? Yeah, Wes Boron. Yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So this, he band, left for a while. this kid yeah, was yeah. in a band that was opening on the road. They mm -hmm. had a song on the radio, he told me. He goes, let me play. Because my song is on the radio. This kid was broke. Wow. And I go, how do you make money? He goes, we're going out on the road to pay the advance to do the song. I go, what are you talking about? I didn't know how. I mean, this kid was living off of me, and I had no money. Like, if I went and got a burrito, I'd buy him a burrito or something yeah. like that, like yeah. a breakfast fucking bagel. Yeah. And I'm like, how the fuck are you on tour? And he was telling me, breaking it down. And he lived around the corner with his girlfriend. His girlfriend, I guess, maintained. And But this kid was fucking opening up for Limp Biscuit yeah. on the road, tour. Like, he was home for two weeks. Broke. Wow. And he was telling me how the, this is 2000. This is when they were, you know, uh, Napster and all this yeah, shit, yeah. 98, whatever, all this shit. How is there no money and you're on tour? Don't yeah. they give you nothing? So you're just on tour paying back the record label for yeah. the videos no, no, or no, something no, like that? No, 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 that's separate. I mean, the way that it used to be back in the day, um, the label did not touch anything of your live performance. That was back then. Yeah. Now it's a 360 yeah. deal, though. Yeah. Yeah, now it's completely different. But back then, you know, there was a separation between label and touring. You know, they they were not tied in. Yeah. So your money was yours from touring. Yeah, from touring. Uh, but then again, that's. Uh, but they would give you tour support, tour which events. meant yeah, yeah. It's it, and it went into <coughs> your into the promotion or and you know of the album cost. You but, know, but uh, you paid for everything. Buses, sound man, lights. Yeah. And it was all recoupable, of course, yeah. you know, tour support. Yeah. Like, you look at this guy like Ozzy, who did nine albums and came out of there with nothing. Well, like, well. Right, there's two different sides. Yeah, to yeah. No, I mean, th this is what happened. Uh, uh, Ozzy was signed uh, through management and as manager, you know, Don Arden, Jet, Jet, Re uh, Jet Management, and Jet Records. He was signed to the label again, another production deal. Uh, they were on Epic, Epic through Jet Records. So if you look at an Aussie record, it's, it's a Jet, uh, Jet Records uh, label, right? And um, so again, it was one of those situations. And Sharon was part, part of the management team. Her dad was there. Yeah. Right, her dad but was I got to tell you, they invested. Uh, Jet Records invested money in Aussie. They, uh, they, they believed in him. 
you know, that's it all. That, that first tour, Blizzard of Oz, that was financed, a dance by Jed Records, who was also the manager, Ozzy's manager. Yeah, yeah. So they really believed in him. Yeah, you know, it, was, it was a huge risk. A couple of weeks ago, we had somebody on here, and we were talking about the abuse that the Beatles did to this country. Like, these kids are too fucking young. But if you were around in 66, 67, you know, the, the Beatles were claiming that Paul was dead and, you know, he's walking around barefoot and Sergeant Peppers and all this shit's going on. You know, Beatle fans had it the hardest. Beatle fans are like Catholics. They took a fucking beating. Then when they broke up, they kept threatening they were going to come back. You know, any, anytime anybody got popular, I went to see this band, ZZ Top. They're fucking great. Some jerk off in the room will go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait till the Beatles come back. They ain't better. And you lose the argument. You know what I'm saying? Like, But then John Lennon got shot. And a little piece of you were like, thank God he got shot. Because now the Beatles ain't getting back together. And I win my argument. You know what I'm saying? Led Zeppelin is fucking better than the Beatles, you know? But it's so weird how, all right, all that shit went down with the Beatles and all that time. That music is so important to bring the country back. Like in the 70s, like I was watching that CNN show on the 70s. Well, you told me that. And they had 1973, there was $2 billion in music ticket sales. That's how many tours, right? 73. 73, who wasn't touring? Not only that, I mean, tickets were like 10 bucks or five yeah. bucks. That's a lot of but a lot of touring to come up with that much money. Yeah. fucking dollars. That's yeah. fucking crazy. But if you look and you go, because you know me, I'm a fucking nutcase. I'm gonna, I'm gonna holly, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm in a hotel in, a, in, in some shit town. Jump down the, the morning, rabbit hole. As soon as I saw that, I went online. You had to see. It's like who wasn't on tour? Yeah. In 1973, who wasn't? Yeah. Stones, Zeppelin, yeah. Deep Purple, Deep Purple, Alice Cooper, Black Sabbath, yeah. Elton John, David yeah. Bowie. Elton oh, John was Bowie. killing them. Yeah. Seventy three, he was yeah. just starting to fucking get warmed up. Rod Stewart and well, the that's faces. Crazy. Oh, if you yeah. think about yeah. it, if each ticket yeah. averaged yeah. out to ten dollars. Yeah. Yeah. That's two hundred million seats. Yep. Yeah. That they sold. Yeah, it's crazy. Easy. Easy. Did you watch that special? They're doing the eighties. Comes uh -huh. out in April. I couldn't find it, man. But I'm gonna say who YouTube. steals the show? Who? Oh. Fucking Heart. Heart. Incredible. They show them. I mean, whoring Sita. I know. I the know. chubby one yeah. was fucking skinny. Oh, yeah. And that blonde came out and started doing yeah. this bolero type yeah. thing. Like, ba -da 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 -da. like the light was just on her. And all of a sudden, she just. And that fucking. Like, boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Boom, oh. boom, 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 boom. Oh, Fleetwood Mac. I mean, it was just a yep. different fucking time, yeah. you know? So it's just, there was so much fucking money. Where'd this fucking money go? Eagles. And you hear all these stories. You hear, you know, you hear CCR, another guy that didn't get a fucking a dime. He didn't yeah. sign something or something, not a dime. And yeah, that's the other thing. That's how you wrote that good music. You know, you, you sit here and you say to yourself, you know what, I did coke for 20 years. I didn't get nothing good out of it. Oh, yeah. Something had to come good because yeah. all those motherfuckers wrote all those songs. Yeah. And they were fucking writing all those movies. The Exorcist, they didn't write that on, <laughs> on mocha lattes from Starbucks, I'll tell you that much. You know, it just brought something up, you know. Yeah. That, that just happened, you know, lately. It's, it's, you know, I grew up with 60s music. And every single band that mattered to me had a political statement. You know, politics and rock and roll have never been divided. They've been united. As a matter of fact, I think that the best music came out of the 60s just because of that. You know, people have something to say, something to stand for. Nowadays, I go online and I don't even make a commentary. I just post something that somebody else posted. I get, I get flamed. People telling me, oh, listen, no, we don't want to hear your political views because we just want to enjoy your music. You know, fuck you. First of all, it's my freedom of speech, you know, my right to express myself. Second of all, this is the problem with music today. It's like most bands, most artists don't have a political point of view just because they're afraid of, like, I'm going to offend somebody. You know, the best music, you go back to the 60s, CCR, you know, uh, what is it? The, the Fortunate uh, Son. Uh, Fortunate Son. <clears throat> What better political statement than that? Yeah. You know, nowadays it's like, oh, you're going to offend somebody if you, you know, write a song like that. Look at the Doors, you know, Apocalypse Now soundtrack. It's all freaking Doors music, you know. That's what they were in the jungle. That's what they were listening to. That's they were listening is. to the Doors, man, you know. John Lennon doing a sit-in 
at, at a hotel room, you know, give peace a chance, you know, all of this, you know, different political views, whatever. But people had something to say, and it was the musicians. Well, uh, most of the time, Bob Dylan, another one, who actually gave you something to hold on to, something to, to believe in, you know, to stand by and say, yes, I agree with you. Thank you for putting it together into a song that I can actually, you know, s feel it, you know, get it in my heart, in my soul, you know. It was very interesting on that, on that special. They spoke about how Marvin Gaye went to Motown and said, look. That's up. another one. Yeah. He said, look, bro, yeah. I like what you're doing, but I ain't doing that shit with five black guys dancing behind me. You think I'm kidding you? That's what he told him. Watch the fucking special. He goes, I ain't no cookie cutter. Yeah. I'm not doing that. I want to yeah. write a song about what's going on. Yeah. And he wrote what's yeah. going on. Yeah. And it was brilliant. And then Stevie Wonder went into his office yeah. and said, I want to do what he's doing. Yeah. I ain't doing it. And he yeah. put out four yeah. albums in a yeah. row that only yeah. match Pink Floyd's run. That that dark side, yeah. Yeah. metal, yeah. Animals. wall, yeah. animals. Like Stevie Wonder, because they had something to say. I mean, the, the, the ended, it ended with uh, Songs in the Key of Life, which I was a little fucking mm. kid, and I remember yeah. my mom had it at the bar, my head almost fucking blew up. You're right. They did yeah. have something to it, and yeah. that's what changed the yeah. music. The Stones, that's what made you Sympathy change. Sympathy for the Devil. Yeah. You know, listen to those lyrics. If, they, if, that's, if, that's, if those are not political, social political statements, you know, you're not, you know, you're not reading it right. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. And their whole battle, like against the taxes and, and going into exile and writing exile on Main Street, yeah. like fuck you, you ain't taking our money anymore, you know. Back then, fifty percent, you know, they blazed, lived in a house and lived in exile, keep all their money, rad, <laughs> you yeah. know. You know, you brought a a good point up last time you were on the show, and I'm doing it this year. I'm going to like three or four shows this year. I've planned to go into three or four shows, let my mind shut down. Black Sabbath being one of them. I don't care what the ticket costs. Yeah, Hollywood Bowl? Well, everybody's complaining that the ticket prices are too high. They're doing the bowl or the forum? They're doing both. Okay, I think I'll do Hollywood Bowl. I'm going to see David Gilmore. Mm -hmm. I'm going to that. Okay. It's at the bowl. At the bowl. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there was somebody else I wanted to see this year because that's it. You're right. You're never going to get a chance to yeah. see this yeah. again. I, for years, I, I just, I didn't want to go see somebody, but sing with a lip machine or whatever the fuck it is but you know what I, I don't give a fuck I want to go you know everybody yeah. said that for years Ozzy had a, a guy behind a curtain that sang for him and shit like the Wizard of Oz yeah. or something like that you know what I'm going to fucking go I'm it's gonna inspiring go. well the only way to write so the only way to be creative is to uh, get entertained totally sometimes you have to go get entertained you know uh, one thing about Rudy is you see all those old Kennison things Rudy was a fan of stand up yeah Rudy likes stand. That's oh, how we met. That's Big how time. we met. Big time. He saw yeah. me at the Nokia, mm -hmm. and uh, he came backstage. And he said, "Man, you were great." And I was Where like, "Where was this at? Who were you I with?" I was opening for Artie Lang. Yeah, they were opening for Artie. Yeah. yeah, I went there with Rich. You know. And he came yeah. back, and I was like, "Oh, Rudy, sorry." So I was all over him like a fucking maniac kid, and uh, and he said, "You were great, man." And then he came to some other shows and stuff, and and did the podcast and. And we became great friends, you know. But he is a comedy guy, and then, and then I forgot about the wild thing and all that. And I was like, oh my god, he was with Sam at the store and wild thing and all that. I gotta tell you, most musicians that I know, they think that they're fucking funny. They think they're comedians. That's all we do in the bus. You know, we we, we take our music serious, and then we get off, and we're just like fucking around all the time. And I think, yeah, forty percent of comedians are musicians that didn't have the balls to go through with it. Like, I still have doubts about going and picking up a guitar because I know I'm scared. I know what's going to happen. Yeah, but I how more scary can it be than just to stand there with the mic in no, your no, hand no, no, and, no. and you tell don't jokes, man? No, 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 no. I'm scared of how it's going to take over my life. <sighs> I could see me at 56 doing a fucking uh, Rudy Sarzo cover band. <laughs> you follow me? Yeah, I yeah. I mean, I could see myself doing it. I could see it. I could just go... I could see myself playing, getting enthralled with it, now telling my wife, fuck you. I'm going to go on the road every week and do comedy. But meanwhile, all I really want to do is get in the hotel room <laughs> and play my fucking guitar. Yeah. Instead of snorting coke. In the old days, it was snorting coke. Sure, I'll go on the road. Christmas Eve, fuck yeah. Alaska, I'm there. Because <laughs> all I wanted to do was snort coke. That's the only way I could do it, by getting away from my girlfriend. Yeah. So I could see me doing the same thing. I loved the guitar that much. You think you would travel with it? Oh, fuck yeah. Listen, 
Fuck these punk ass bitches who travel with skateboards. Listen, I travel every week, and every fucking week I sit there and look at some dumb fuck bring something on a plane. And I gotta ask myself, is it that important to bring a skateboard, you dumb motherfucker? <laughs> so it's time for me to bring my motherfucking ukulele. You think I'm mm-hmm. kidding you? I'll get like a little ukulele with a little, what do you call them, a pig nose? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the old days, yeah. and I'll fucking blast that fucking hotel room from six to six. I know it. I have a per, uh, an addictive personality. Yep. And it's something I've always wanted to do. Once I got the head to do it, it's going to scare me. I'm going to get enthralled with it. And next thing you know, I'm going to be calling Dean, how do you start a band? And asking stupid <laughs> musician <laughs> questions. Yeah. And people are going to say, Joey actually thinks he's a fucking musician. Somebody better tell him he's fucking 60, fat, and he ain't going to be able to jump <laughs> up and down. You know, fuck you. I ain't, what, what is that? Fuck uh, you. you won't t- I ain't doing what you tell me. <laughs> You might say, that's you, I that's me at 60. Me. I'll be up there. Fuck you. I won't do what you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give some shout outs and we'll get Rudy out of here. Everything all right, Rudy? Yeah, yeah, we're rocking. You beautiful <laughs> motherfucker. You. <laughs> Tasha Howell, I got the cancer bracelet. I'm going to put it on over the 12 days of Christmas. Bob and Becky and Olivia Linlages. Lilingus, I love you motherfuckers. Thank you for the Bruce Lee book. Thank you for the present for my daughter. Thank you for Lee's present. Yeah, the, the, they gave me the Red the Sox. Boston oh, Red my Sox God. Thing. Those were amazing. Thank you. John and Ann Coulter. You know how much I love you, motherfuckers. I just met John for coffee. Robert Woolridge. Armando Salgado. My main man, JT, always got my back. Chris Cordwell. Dante Gazzini. And podcast quotes. I love you, motherfuckers. You know what I'm saying? What's up, Lisa? Yeah, how you feeling today? I don't know what you gave me, but it's strong as fuck. I don't fuck. know what you gave me, but it's strong as fuck. You know what I gave you? I gave you the same shit they gave Aldo the other night. They uh-huh. dosed that motherfucker. That was just some good fights. That was a great fight. Those are great fights, man. <laughs> Damien, was... Damien Maya blew my mind. Oh, please. I, I, don't, I don't level. think he wanted to submit him. I no, was just, just wanted, wanted to fuck with just, him a little bit. Oh, my God. So I was tell, Did I tell him on the podcast what I did the other night, my creepy, addictive personality? Yeah. I was telling you before the fight that I went with Jim Norton after the Rogan show in oh, Vegas. Oh, gamble, yeah. Bet on the let's fight. Let's go to the casino real quick. Let me go see what the lines are on the fights. And between you and me, I told Joe Rogan, I'm betting 1000 on Aldo, 1000 on Weidman, and 1000 on the Cuban Romero. Oh, you would have lost. Oh, I would have lost everything. <laughs> Romero barely won. The Cuban barely fucking won. <laughs> that little cheating motherfucker. Did you see him holding the fence? And, uh, <laughs> holding the fence. I love it. And I walked over there and I looked at everything. And again, like my, the rest of the things in my life, I became a pussy. I was like, I'm not fucking betting nothing. And I go, fuck yeah. Why do you come to Vegas, Joe? You don't drink. You don't get your dick sucked. You don't play Wheel of Fortune. You do nothing. You come, you perform, and you eat something, and you leave. Go do something with your life. Go at least add some fun. So I went over and I put $100 on an Aldo. But when I'm standing on the board, I go, oh, shit. There's a bet for under three rounds. And I put 50 bucks on that, 60 bucks. What the fuck I had in my pocket? 50 bucks. And I went back to my room and I'm like, wait a second. That's the bet of the year. I don't even fucking gamble. Yeah. This, I can't lose. I can't lose. This fight's going to end under three rounds. I called my wife. I woke her up out of a deep sleep and I go, do me a favor. Put 800 bucks on my books. <laughs> She's like, what are you talking about? What are you doing? I go, I'm going to bet. Fuck, I got to bet. She's like, Joey, what the fuck? You did not call your wife. Yes, put 800 on my books. <laughs> yes, I did. I only had like 300 on there. I go, put 800 on my fucking books. <laughs> and I got up at 5. I really, when I called to get the wake-up call, it was the Mandarin Hotel. These motherfuckers said, do you want a pot of coffee, Mr. Diaz? I said, you know what? Bring the pot and leave it in the valet box at 4.45. I go, you guys got breakfast, too? They go, yeah, we do. I go, listen, why fuck around? Let's put the order in right now. Let me get two eggs, a little fruit, some wheat toast, butter, some juice, and uh, no fucking potatoes. Give me uh, fruit because I don't want to give me wheat toast, whatever. Bro, I got up before the alarm went off. I ate it. I fucking, I was already packed. All I had to pack was my sleep apnea machine. I went downstairs and I got a cab to the MGM Grand and I bet the rest of the fucking 950. So I bet Aldo for 100. And I never tell this shit. Even Lee, I didn't tell him what I bet. Yeah. I bet not a thousand bucks on the fight with him under the third round. And I went home. And I knew it was going to win. I was more, you know, I sat there going, Jesus, I could have. And I had a great time. And I told my wife, she goes, What'd you do? How'd you end up making out? I gave her the ticket. I said, Mail it in, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Mail it 
Merry fucking Merry, Merry Christmas, motherfucker. <laughs> oh, and she just looked on. at me like, Joey, you fucked up. It's yours. I don't give a fuck. I don't want the money. I was just proving a fucking yeah, point. Yeah, I yeah. never gambled, dog. I go to Vegas, ask Lee for three I days. Either. I don't do nothing with Rudy Sarzo. You just call me. What Rudy Sarzo. The only thing I do is smoke e-cigarettes. <laughs> Because you don't do nothing no more. How long can we stand there, Rudy? Yeah, no. It used to be in the old days, we got at least get a Coca-Cola, a Diet Coke, and put a cherry in it, or a lime, and lie to people. Tell them we've got a rum and coke. Yeah, now was, we don't even do that. It was Pepsi and uh, condensed milk. Buy it. Yeah. Pepsi. No, no, you really weren't. <laughs> condensed <doing> milk. <laughs> oh, yeah, we were talking about Cuban yeah. eating habits. Yeah, yeah. And how Cubans could be 400 pounds if you let them. <laughs> because when you're a kid, you dip. Cubans get bread. Yeah. And they put butter on it, and then they put it in the toaster this way, and they slam. But before you slam the bread down, you take the paintbrush filled with butter, right. and you put it on top of the bread, Lee. Oh, you right. watch this, Lee? <laughs> so you take the bread, you yeah. cut it, Lee. Then you Italian bread, like Cuban Italian bread, you put the butter in the middle, you close it, and you put it on the thing, you put butter on the thing, butter on top of the bread, and you slam it. Then You get you the had a press at your house? <sighs> If you don't have a press in your Cuban, you're slipping, okay? <laughs> That's like a Jew without a yarmulke and a secret, secret, secret bank account. Every Jew has a secret, secret, secret bank account. What do you got in the bank? Look, let's go to the ATM machine. I'm telling you, I only got $90. Come on, show me the real fucking account here. <laughs> show me the real one under your grandmother's maiden name, top sucker. You got to have a press. Then your mother makes you a big bowl of coffee. It's not a cup like these fucking Americans. <laughs> Let's go drink a cup. Oh, give me a vente. What fucking vente? Cubans drink a bowl of coffee. <laughs> that shit that'll kill a mule. Top ramen And bowl. they put fucking whole milk in that motherfucker with a tub of sugar. Then they wait for the toast to come out. You take the toast out, Lee, and you cut it across the middle. So instead of two pieces, you have four pieces now. And you take that motherfucker and you dip it in the milk and coffee. That's Cuban. That's Cuban savagery. Oh, that's Cuban savagery. That's after the egg with the fucking egg on. That's after the steak with the egg on top of it over the white rice. And you slice the egg yolk, and the egg yolk covers the egg and the white rice. It's called huevo a caballo. Do you understand me? If, I wanna, if anybody's skinny here and they really want to get fat, contact me. I'll give you what's called the Cuban diet. And then before you go to sleep, Cubans do something for the late night. Like when I first came from Cuba... I was always under the impression, this is how stupid your Uncle Joey is, that chocolate was only to be eaten at night. Because the way I looked at it, it said, chocolate late. You know how <laughs> yeah. late? Lo- yep. So in my Cuban mind, late meant you ate chocolate at night. Chocolate. Chocolate. <laughs> and so chocolate, <laughs> compadre, chocolate, late. You have to eat that at night. What the fuck? <laughs> Cubans said, no, we don't eat chocolate at night. We got something better for you. Go get a can of Materva. Materva. Materva is made from what root? root? Mate. Mate, and it's delicious. It's sweet. You take three inches of condensed milk. You put aluminum foil to cover it. That's the old Cuban way. That's yeah. before the lid. You just get yeah. aluminum foil, and you pour that. You, this is what you do. You would put the condensed milk in the glass and walk away, and it would just drip little by little. It's like when you fuck 18 times. That last nut, it just <laughs> drips out of your nut and just falls on your foot. It was just like that, Lee. And you take three fingers, and you put the materba in there, and you stir that motherfucker up. And if you're real Cuban, you get Cuban crackers, and you put butter on them. And you eat the fucking <laughs> Cuban oh, crackers oh, with the oh. butter. Or a media noche, which is named after midnight. Midnight. Midnight sandwich, because you had that at midnight. Because if, if you went to sleep without food, you could starve to death in your sleep, because you're not <laughs> eating for eight hours. Oh, I should have been Cuban. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Now, the media noche and the Cuban sandwich are different. What is the difference? Uh, it's the pork and, and, the, and the pickle. And the pickle. The pickle, right. yeah. Right. That's the medianoche because the pickle might give you nightmares yeah. of dragons and yeah. Cuban people chasing you down the yeah. street. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what's that? You, you, you got ham and pork. And pork. <laughs> double double hard That's attack. Right. <laughs> Bro, if you really, really want to get fat, like if yeah. you're a skinny guy and you want to lift weight seriously and get 30 pounds, I got the recipe for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, I Talk got about the, the steak one. Like, Which you one? You have that for breakfast? Bro, when I was really dingy and skinny at one time, my mom would sit there. Once the emulsive of cod didn't work, because I was raised on emulsive of cod. My mother thought that emulsive of cod was the cure-all, be-all. You know what emulsive of cod is? No. Nope. Em- emulsion de cot. Bacalao. Bacalao, which oh, is yeah. just bacalao. another word for yeah. bacalao. I know it's what that bacalao is. Bacalao milk. I love that. It's like yeah. a hot dog for fish. 
the yeah. fins, the eyeballs, Ugh. the guts, the stomach. It's like a filter fish. They yeah. blend that up with milk, and then you take it in a teaspoon in the morning. Let me explain something to you. Oh. If every man over 50 <laughs> takes a mulsive of cod, there'll be more fucking people being born than ever before. Just and, bone or sitting? Bro, a mulsive of cod when you're six gives you hard-ons. <laughs> you can't even <laughs> fucking rest and watch Popeye. You just sit there with your mouth open. <laughs> Like you're doing two pounds of heroin and cough mm-hmm. medicine. Cuban Viagra? Emulsive of cod. My mom would sit there and fucking stare at me and go, you're not going to school till you have this. And I'll beat you. Oh. And you had to fucking take it and then <laughs> drink orange juice. It got to the point where my mom would just pour it into the orange juice like vodka, stare it oh. and give it to me. But then after that, you got to eat a steak over, you know. You know uh, well, if you put a scoop of white rice, get scoop. Get cool. Mete un cucharón ahí, compadre. They give you a fucking spoon <laughs> flat over a thing. And then they put a fucking steak, a thin uh, palomilla. That means they butterfly it. Yeah. And you get like an eight-ounce steak. And then they put a fried egg over that. And it's not fried in granola oil. And yeah, granola oil. Coconut oil, <laughs> it's fried in fucking butter, Jack. And lard. And lard. lard. Manteca de puerco. Manteca de puerco. That <laughs> sits by the window. It's pig fat. And it gets hard as fucking concrete. Oh, and, they, and they cut into it. And they throw a chunk on the frying pan. And it oh. fucking sizzles up again. <laughs> and you take that egg when it sizzles on the steak. And that's when you cut the yolk and you make the yolk go on the right rice. Has anybody ever eaten oh. egg and white rice? Oh, no. yeah. I know. Yeah. We have. Yeah. And, and, and the back of your mind is fucking disgusting. I've eaten it. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> Sounds amazing. But would you fucking stop, Lee? But if you're, one, if you're skinny and you lift weights yeah. and you eat one of those every day, two yolks over a fucking steak and white rice... Whoop. The possibilities are endless. <laughs> What's that one you like? It's like meat with a sausage in the middle? Boliche. Boliche. And you tie Cuban pot roast with a chorizo in the middle. And you tie that fucking steak up around the chorizo. And the chorizo bleeds into the steak. And then you cut it and it falls over. Oh. Jesus Christ. And you see the chorizo looking at you just there. And you take the white rice and you put it to the side. And you put some black beans and rice. You get a few fried bananas. You cut those up. That's a breakfast of champions. Bro. <laughs> you test positive for everything on that shit. And don't forget Noche Buena having the the the, uh, the whole pig on the table, with head and everything. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Rudy, you don't eat yeah. any of that no, stuff no, anymore, I, right? No, no. I, I, t- no. So really, you don't even know. Rudy's done. Rudy's. Yeah, I'm done with pork. Listen, no, bro. Yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. There's Cubans that after 40, they, they yeah. substitute turkey meat because the meat becomes too much. The yeah. amount of food they eat. The, you know, the, I miss my mother. It's been 30-some years. And, I re, and if Rudy knows a Cuban mom, I miss mm-hmm. my mother. But I got to tell you a confession I never said before on any other forum. My mother took her fucking pork so seriously that they were snort in my house on the 23rd. You stayed up all night just marinating the pork. Your family would come over, and, like, the grandma and grandpa would go to sleep, but the 40-year-olds... We'll get aluminum for and they'd put it at the table and they'd have Coke Rocks in it. And they'd sit there all night doing little bumps, drinking dew is on the rocks. My mother and her little crazy whore girlfriends. And they'd have a pig and they'd marinate that pig all night. Orange juice and garlic. Oh, yeah. And you gotta rub it in there. And it was like a ceremony, bro. Wow. It's like a ceremony. Yeah. It's like yeah. a it's a family thing. We're gonna get together, yeah. drink. Yeah. But at the same time we're cooking. And they yeah. mar- and you'd wake up at eight and the house would smell. Like yeah. heaven. When you wake up at a Cuban house on the 24th of December, it's heaven. That yeah. fucking pork. You know, I just took my wife back for Cuban food. My wife's from a fucking farm in Tennessee. She bit into the lechon asal, and the first thing she said to me, she goes, I get it. She goes, they, they, they yeah. fucking, this is wow. work. This is love. Well, it's the el mojo. El mojo. El mojo, el mojo, mojo is, is the like whole thing. Garlic, naranja agria, which is, I don't think you can get those oranges here, which is a sour orange. It's like a mandarin orange or something, and it's it's a whole different flavor. It's like in between a grapefruit and an orange, you know. It's like sour, naranja agria, and garlic, and everything else that goes into it. Mojo. Yeah. And what they would stay up all yeah. night preparing it, yeah. and then at eight in the yeah. morning, that's when they throw it in the oven. So they would do an all night. Is it a shit baked or roasted? It's in the oven. In the uh, well, in, in ours the was in, the, in a spit. In a spit. Yeah. Oh, I yeah, yeah. A spit. like yeah. the broiler. Yeah, like a broiler. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. December twenty fourth, early in the morning, you hear the, the 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 pig squealing. 
you know, like because it's getting killed. It's getting killed, bro. Amazing, then, amazing. But as a kid growing up like that in my culture, that was like, wow, we're gonna eat good tonight. Yeah, you know? yeah. And yeah, you know, which now to me is a horrific, you know, uh, thought. Yeah. But uh, yeah, and then you just start pulling up pieces of the skin. The ears. With, oh. Yeah, you know, the oh, chicharrón. Lee, yeah. you have no idea, the chicharrón. Yeah, chicharrón, you know. And, and those ears are going yeah. like a potato chip. You have yeah. no fucking idea, Lee. Yeah. Oh, my God. And the, and the skin comes yeah. next to the fucking. Did yeah. you ever roast a pig in like your house in Jersey? All the time. My mother, listen, December in a Cuban house is 20 pounds. And it starts December 3rd. There's a Cuban holiday. Then yeah. Wednesday, Chango. Night, Chango, Chango is Thursday yeah, night. Yeah. And then San Lazaro is the 16th. Yeah. That's another big one. And then the 24th, dog. Shit. Yeah. Shit. It's bigger yeah. than Christmas? It is Christmas. It's yeah. Cuban Christmas. Yeah. Then they celebrate the 7th of January. Uh, yeah. What is that? Yeah. That's when the, the yeah. wise kings show up with a grandma el, blow. And el, dia, el dia de los reyes magos. Los reyes magos. And they yeah. give you an envelope. You get cash on that day. <laughs> a grandma blow. Yeah, you get like a grandma Which is actually the 12th day of Christmas. The 12th right. day of Christmas. Yeah, that's what it is, yeah. Rudy, you don't eat meat anymore, right? I uh, I eat meat, but but not pork. What kind of diet do you have? Because you look fantastic. And, uh, uh, vitamins, vitamins, and workout, exercise. You know. Yeah, is it is yeah. it uh is it light weights or do you just walk and It'll jog? Be, no, no. I mean, I I, I do some weights. Uh, yeah. I try not to injure myself now because of my age. And yeah. but one great thing about Medicare. It's uh, the, the, the plan that I have yeah. now. Is <laughs> what the things we're talking about. Yeah. It's called Silver Fit, which is like Medicare Plus. For like uh, $20 a year, you just join like a regular gym instead of like paying, wow. you know, four, four or $500, which in my case, because I spend so much time on the road, I would just like buy like a month here and a month there. But now I just pay 20, 20 bucks a year and that's it. I go to like a 24 fitness place. That's great. Yeah. And then Something the government, to look forward to. Yeah, the government <laughs> pays the other half? Well, you already been paying the other half all these yeah, years. Yeah, it's yeah, been yeah. coming out of your gotcha. salary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Social Security. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Rudy, God bless you, man. God bless it's, you, it's, too. It's, Feliz Navidad. It's hard to believe that I was watching you <laughs> at the Palladium 30-something years ago, and here we are in North Hollywood. Yeah. It's so shit. weird, right? Yeah. It's like a dream come true. You're the sweetest guy in the world. And here you are, 65, looking beautiful. Living your life. Who would have fucking thought we would have still been talking about Ozzy at a table? He's still fucking alive. You know, I, I don't look any different than when I was 64, you know. No, no, you look beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> you look great, man. I, I mean, feel good. I feel good. You know, I, good. I played with him last year, and this guy destroys on stage, man. Like, here's a funny thing. This is when I knew that I was never... Uh, I, Sometimes you wonder as a musician, like, I never got to that next level, you know? And then when I jammed with him, Brian Tishy, and Tracy Guns, when they kicked in, I was like, this is why. These guys are next level dudes, you know? It's, you know, it's just like you guys. You know, you guys put a lot of time into, into your art. You know, I mean, it just don't happen by accident. You got to take some time and develop your, your act and, and your, your, your material you know, your relationship with the audience. It's the same thing for us. You know, it's just put time into it. Yeah, but the way is. you played the bass, I could feel it over there, you know, just the attack, and the, well, and he was so into it. Well, it's like, the same way when I saw you performance, you know, I got it, yeah. and I became an instant fan. Yeah. It's because, you know, you have that connection with the audience. It's the same thing. You have a very rock and roll connection, you know, yeah. you know with the audience. It's like a, it's like a rock musician. You Man. know, and Coco here, he's just freaking amazing. Every time I, I watch him. anything with you on YouTube, you're you're relentless and fearless. <laughs> yeah, he's fearless. Yeah, fearless. I know. It's totally. Like, it's like you're on, 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 on. It's unbelievable. I learned know. so much watching him at the yeah. store, man. Yeah, yeah. he's like an Inve Malmstein level <laughs> of, of comedy. <laughs> 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 just <Love>. shredding. <laughs> it's a shredder. I did the, uh, whenever I tell a Cuban story on those uh. Ari things, I always think of you. I always think in the back of my mind, I, I think of everybody who's Cuban that I know because we grew up different ways and everybody, but yeah. there's still one basis, like the faith part, you know? Mm. And I did this last Ari thing, which will be out this year, and I talked about when I did Santo, you know, as a little kid, and I liked it. I, I really enjoyed it. I, I, I'm a Catholic, bro. Mm. I'm a Catholic. Uh, mm. Just, I don't know. We come from a Catholic country. Cuba's mm. a Catholic country, and mm. I was raised a Catholic, and I still have my beliefs 
in different ways, but I had a, a godmother growing up who I loved dearly. You know, she was a Cuban lady. You know, I always talk about pre-revolutionary Cubans yeah, are the toughest people. You don't want to fuck with them at any level. Pre-revolutionary Cubans, they're the ones that built Miami. They're the ones that had to deal with those Jews <laughs> the first time. They, they're smooth, they're fucking, but they're strong-willed. Pre-revolutionary Cubans put ideas in your head. They dealt with shit. You know, everybody talks about Fidel. Batista was no walk in the fucking park either. Mm -hmm. But there's something about pre-revolutionary Cubans and she was everything to me. And she used to always tell me growing up, put a box away and put your trophies in there. And when you, and she put she made me put my lock of hair in there. And she made me put my brass shoes in there. She made me put newspaper clippings. And she'd go, once a week, I want you to go sit with that fucking box. It was brilliant. And I'd go, why do you fucking make me sit with this box? She goes, because no matter what happens in your life, I want you to remember that, who the fuck you are and where you came from. And I would put shit in there. And when my mother died, she goes, make sure you take that box with you. And you always look at that fucking box once a week because I don't want this experience to... And she, like, knew my mother was going to die. That's why she'd make me fucking get that box every day and look at the box. And I fucking put the box at my friend's house, and I ended up robbing him years later. <laughs> he was a coke dealer, and I left the box. And when I left New York in 85, I bumped into her. She goes, where's the box? And I didn't want to tell her. And I go, it said Martin the Fags, Martin and Maricón. That was yeah. his name. And I go, you know, the box is at his house. And she goes, I'll fucking get it back, whatever. I didn't tell him I robbed Martin. And I lost my box. You know, and through all those years, I lost that box. I had pictures of my mother and pictures of my real father and just little things in there. My, my son, I had a bunch of shit in there. And I made a fucking interview for some religious company in England, and they put the video on. And do you know I got my box back? Oh, some lady did? called me from Miami in 2014. No. We have your box. Uh, my godmother's grandson has the box. What? I flew to Miami. I booked the gig. I got the fucking box. 34 years later, Whoa. I got my fucking soul back. Somebody had that box still? And my life changed. And she brought the box from New York City to 148th Street to Miami on a fucking bus. Wow. Because And she kept saying, even when I die, I know that kid. He's going to come back here for that fucking box. She goes, leave that. The kid... All his life grew up. He's a, he's a man now. He works at Miami International Airport. Yeah. He goes, since I was a kid, I go, Grandma, whose box is that? That's Coco's. One day he's coming back for that box. Even after I'm dead, I know that kid. He's going to come back for that box. Wow. Fucking 2015. I got the box next to my fucking bed. I told that story and I thought about you. Because we lose ourselves in our lives, man. Absolutely. I lost myself for a fucking Absolutely. long time. And you know what? Some people sell their soul. They never get it back, though. I mm. sold my soul. I got it back. Yeah. A lot of people don't get their fucking soul back. And I knew some people would listen to that story and go, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. I know Rudy would think of that story and go, Jesus fucking Christ. Because it's a certain faith you grew up as Cuban. I, I, I've always had that faith. I've always had that belief. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I'm happy you came on, Rudy. And I'm sorry you only got you. A couple of potatoes, fucking portos. They got smarter. They made the potatoes yeah, they smaller. Did, you know, they're fucking communists. They're fucking communists. <laughs> <laughs> when you say Papa Rayen, I figure like yeah, the, the big ones and shit. Yeah, these bowling balls. You yeah, know, all these motherfuckers. <laughs> they don't do it like that no more. <laughs> Listen, uh, you know what frustration is when you want to read about the topics that interest you most, and you have to mentally search for the content on the internet. You know. Uh, for those of us who want premium content and don't have time to waste on finding it, there's a new company called Texture. The best way to read all your favorite mag magazines anytime, anywhere. Texture is the app that gives you an all-access pass to the world's best magazines right on your phone or tablet. Browse hundreds of magazines and cherry-pick the articles that interest you the most. The Texture editorial team recommends stories for you daily, plus their curated collections let you dive into deeper into the topics. Do me a favor, sign up for Texture right now, and in mere seconds, you're going to gain inside access to the very best reads plus exclusive content with full access to the top magazines across the board of every interest. I mean, from Lulu to InStyle to Hot Rod to Oprah to, to Seventeen to National Geographic, Rolling Stone, The New Yorker, U.S. Weekly, Us Weekly, whatever, I'm sorry, Teen Vogue, The Hollywood Reporter. They got everything. Here's the best part. Texture's offering my listeners a free trial right now 
when you go to texture.com slash Joey. Even better, get Texture as a gift between now and December 31st. Think about that. You'll gain unrestricted access to the world's best magazines from back issues to the one on newsstands today. Order this fantastic gift for you or a loved one before December 31st. Try Texture for free right now when you go to texture.com slash Joey. Again, Texture app is the easiest way to remain culturally curious with the top stories and new and noteworthy sections updated throughout the day. Plus, you can share your subscription with the whole family. You can download articles and whole issues for online reading. Go to texture.com right now slash Joey. What do you think about that, motherfuckers? I actually like that. I'm I not, like that. Texture's not bad. I still love magazines. You man. download the articles before you go on a plane. Yeah. You can read the certain ones. And Rolling Stone, I mean, how many fucking magazines do you really read? Three yeah. or four? Yeah. Rolling Stone, Us Weekly, whatever the fuck. As always, on it, my main people. You know, I think that you're on this stuff because you look beautiful. On it, What's number one product is Alpha Brain. It's a complete earth grown nootropic. What is it? Oh, yeah. Onnit is like a, it just, it's tough to describe. Onnit is a company that makes supplements for you. And what they do is like they have Shroom Tech, Sport, and Immune. Like if I fly a lot, like I flew, I took Shroom Tech Immune. I didn't get sick. My wife got sick. Okay. Uh, Shroom Tech Sport gives you more endurance. It has quadricep. Um, uh, mushrooms in them, and they just give you more oxygen. Is it a multivitamin? And not really. They have multivitamins, other things. They have tea oil. They have yeah. testosterone boosters. Anyway, go to honor.com right now, slash Joey, and get 10% no, off your first book. Church. church. What is it? It's honor.com and use code word church. Honor.com with the code word church and get 10% off your first order. Also, you get on the Stay Honor program and they deliver it right to your house on a weekly motherfucking basis, okay? Honor's got some great stuff. When I fly, I take the turnaround 160, which is this with a bunch of other stuff. 180. I'm sorry. It has <laughs> yeah. the same 360. Yeah. And Hitty Cigs, the best in hit vapor <laughs> cigarettes, okay? They f they're tremendous. Zero, eight, 16, and 24 milligrams and a cigar. That's what they got. Usually they go for 20 bucks a piece because you're friends with me. You get them for 10 bucks a piece. They got a special five for 50 off of. Go to HittySigs.com and press in. Joey's Church. Boom! And get five for 50, and that's it, all right? Oh, I want to pump my uh, punchline. Hold on one second. Yep. Texture.com <laughs> right now. What is it? Slash Joey. Slash Texture.com slash Joey. On it. Code dot com slash Joey. No. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> Good. It's on it. Code word church. All right. And hit these six. Now, Joey's I need a church. big favor from you guys. I don't need no fucking favor. September 28th and 29th, my buddies Dean Delray is going to be at the San Francisco Punchline or at Cobbs? Yeah, Punchline. At the Punchline downtown. Listen, if you don't go to this show, shoot yourself right fucking now, okay? <laughs> you know when we go to San Francisco how we do it. Please go over and see him. Tickets are available where? At punchline.com. Sla slash Joey, nothing? No, it's just Okay, fuck it. Punchline.com, <laughs> punchline Dean Delray. And when do you start your little thing again, yeah. my brother? Um, it starts at the beginning of the year with NAM show, and then it goes to I'm doing a uh, Axes and Anchors cruise. It's a rock and roll cruise. And who's on that week? Uh, I'm doing uh, some shows with Tracy, We're, you know, Gonzo, our band. And then uh, Rock, uh, uh, Randy Rhodes, Remember, and all of that. So a bunch of guys, Zach Weil and Inve and and just a Bumblefoot, a bunch of, you It's know, incredible. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's in a boat. And where's the cruise go to? Uh, Key West and the Bahamas, the Caribbean. Oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah, four, four days. So we'll send Lee and the girlfriend with you. Yeah. To yeah, give yeah, me yeah. live reports. Yeah. Look at them. We sh you okay. should, yes. Yeah, so I'll, I'll definitely go. Yeah, total rock and roll cruise. And then after that, I, I'm off to Europe and... Uh, in Russia. With Gunzo? No, no, with something else. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Cool. Yeah. Good to have you here. I love you. It's Felicidad. Love you, too. Love you. Felicidad. We can do a little something with my man Dean Delray. Oh, I, love, I love both of you guys, man. <laughs> uh, Rudy has just been an unbelievable friend, and so have you. So it's just... It's just amazing. I would podcast with you every day. Dude. And what about Lee? You don't like Lee? No yeah, I love Lee. Lee. I love Lee. Lee. Lee just doesn't text me late at night like you. Okay. You know? Okay. He doesn't check up on me. <laughs> All right. Lee's got to start checking up on people. I love you guys. We'll be back tomorrow. Uh, thank Rudy Sarzo. Also, my man, Dean Delray, and the Flying Jew for coming on. We'll be back tomorrow. I'm in San Diego Thursday night. Second show got added. So go do your fucking thing. See you Thursday. I love you guys. Stay black. You gotta go to the bathroom, Rudy. Uh oh, you gotta go. Yeah, I gotta go. <laughs>